Hey, how'd my father die? Forty-nine times We fought that beast Your old man and me and Had a chicken head with duck feet With a woman's face too Oh, that's rad And it was waiting in the bushes for us Then it ripped off your dad's face He was screaming something awful In fact, there was this huge mess And I had to change the floors The floors? You see his blood, it drained into the boards And I had to change them But we all got a chicken duck woman thing waiting for us Every day I worry all day I was waiting in the bushes of love Cause something's waiting in the bushes for us Something's waiting in the bushes of love yeah, Every day I worry all day I was waiting in the bushes of love Something's waiting in the bushes for us Something's waiting in the bushes of love Yo, never knew my dad, he didn't care about me Dead horizon is all my macro binocular see Moisture farming all my life and not a drop spilled My aunt and uncle double sons and sipping blue milk My aunt and uncle double sons, I'm sick of blue milk But then a desert hobo came and told me Got a chicken duck woman thing waiting for us Every day I worry all day I was waiting in the bushes of love Something's waiting in the bushes for us Yeah, something's waiting in the bushes of love yeah, Every day I worry all day I was waiting in the bushes of love Something's waiting in the bushes for us Something's waiting in the bushes of love. And Bob. Remember, you are my number one. And I. Yes, sir.
ladies and gentlemen welcome to another special wednesday edition of this show like this is this isn't gonna happen all the time it's gonna happen all the time but every once in a while we, we'll do a special show just to accommodate a really awesome guest and that's what we're doing here tonight sean how are yes. you doing tonight doing great doing great finished on page 21 of type one today excellent working on some other other noodles and hopefully get some noodles colors in for the weekend so i can oh. show off and be like look at me so things are going good things are going good getting the campaign ready that's awesome by the way this saturday at noon may 13th we are adding the supplemental book to the reaper destroyer campaign so we will be here sean will also be showing off some things for type one so uh tune in hang out with us this saturday uh for a few hours it's gonna be a good time it's gonna be fun it's gonna be a, uh, a good book say hey to the chat real quick before we start the show we got here in the steadfast was first hell Hail, brother. Good to see you. We've got Mark, member of the channel, says, ask Aaron how he got on Gen 13 at Wildstorm. We will definitely we'll do. do that. We'll I'm going to tag that just so we don't forget. We're going to get into that. Member of the channel, Tarks9 is in the house yeah. as well. Says, uh, hail, or yeah, hail Aaron and uh, WOG Blood Hunters. What does WOG stand for? Am I dumb? Breath of God. Oh, see, I'm dumb. You guys can't break down stuff like that. I just, from my, my brain doesn't register letters <laughs> when it's supposed to be an abbreviation of a title i don't i don't know why it just it doesn't good way to start it off it has that's it has, it has a horrible way to start uh duck bacon member of the channel is in the house as well hail to you brother yeah. we've got wiley j draws love it samurai wolf is now available on a region one dvd and blu-ray a great spaghetti western inspired samurai film worth your time if you love great movies oh, that's that we do that we do i, I do love the old we'll uh, try to bootleg it somehow i'm kidding <laughs> we got agent cub is in the house he said oh man i can't uh believe i've missed the show you did you missed i can't it. wait yeah yeah, yeah. yeah it's uh, we're restarting yeah. just for you buddy we got pizza in the house pizza we can't pronounce his name right so he told nah. us just on pizza so that's what we'll no. do pizza. Yeah. hail brother good to see you yeah. uh chris mack as well hail good hail. to see you we got member of the channel mike mcmahon Mighty dropping McMahon. in the uh what did you, what did you drop in it's hard the hails, the hails in the chat. Love it. Appreciate you, brother. Uh, let me get down here. Oh, Jeremy, we were just talking. Or Bancroft was just giving you a good shout out in his show. Your channel is growing, doing the, mm -hmm. the from after show now, as well as Game of Thrones. Everything Monday nights to do with Game of Thrones. Yeah, just killing it over there, man. I still have not been able to watch from. I got to figure out how to do it so I can catch up. That's why I haven't been catching your show because I don't want to have any spoilers. So one day, though, I will jump in on the fun there. You got Chauncey Blakey in the house as well. Hail, brother. Good to in see you. In charge as always, brother. Remember the channel. Hail the Lord says hail. Hail. Charles, Charles Revis is here. Good oh. to see you guys. And also member of the channel, MB Bonner. Ahoy, Joe and Sean. Ahoy to you. Mutt's here. Oh, oh, oh. We got, we got Rick Sailor. Member of the channel, Rick Sailor. Thank you, brother, for being here. Appreciate you. Uh, I did see somebody say, yeah, Duck Bacon said, uh, Mother F and Mark Sylvester. Yes. Yes. Maybe I should get a uh, emoji of Mark in the in the chat for something I, I think that would work uh, I'm, gonna look, I'm gonna work on that yeah uh oh shit yeah absolutely hit me up man uh dm me let me know uh how we can do that that'd be awesome that'd be awesome all right wednesday night i'm feeling good special day welcome to art and stuff 20 something years in the business on technicality jersey's finest editor extraordinaire hispanic god on paper creator mm. type one the only one except except no duplicates Sean Aaron, with me as always, my brother not. I'm very talented, very sexy, very distinguished. Always narcissistic, but never vain. Staunch defender, Rob Liefeld, Gina Carano, and a lover of all things 90s. Joseph Michael Sontag, or Joe Sontag if you prefer, as the Pope likes to call me, JMS. Welcome to the show, and as always, what an awesome show it is we have for you tonight. Uh, we do have uh, Survive Infinity 0088 just jumped in. Hail yeah. to you, brother. But we have an awesome guest. We've wanted to talk to this dude for a while. You all know him. You all love him. Uh, Sean, do you have an intro? Oh yeah, he, he's worked at Marvel. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking your, I'm taking your thunder here. I'm, I'm gonna let you get Malibu, <laughs> uh, Crossjet, Dark Horse, uh, with his own uh, creator own comic, Wraith of God on Part Two. He's killing it. He's he's super inspiring. Uh, I'm I'm very jealous of the talents that comes out of his hands. Truth, Mr. Aaron Lepresti. Welcome to the show, my friend. How you oh, doing? Man. Thank you for having me. Great Absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you for coming on. This is great. Yeah. Um, just looking at diving into talking to some really awesome art. Love what you're doing with Wraith of God. Uh I you know, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm new to the party when it comes to 
when it comes to you and your art. I'll say that you, Sean goes farther back than I do. Um, but I've been in and out of comics. So I've, I've got to get into, or I've, I've got to know you a little bit better since the, the comic skate thing happened and just really kind of diving into your stuff. And I absolutely love it. I love some of the new stuff you're doing right now. I don't mean to, to, to ramble too much, but I know we were on, I think we were on a stream together not too long ago. And you were talking a little bit about all the detailed stuff you're starting to kind of, or that you put into the Wraith of God stuff. And I think there was a conversation going on. Maybe it was Malin's channel. I can't remember about, you know, just getting into like the thick blacks or something like that. Or maybe that was, maybe that was uh Fragan. Now that I think about it, regardless, I love your stuff. Kind of reminds me a little bit of, of rights and rambling on here. Very excited. No, I mean, it's like trying to remember which show, you know, any of us have been on at any given day is pretty hard. It's hard, hard right? Yeah. There's I don't so even many. remember. <laughs> <laughs> so many. Uh, yeah. So anyway, sorry, chat. Didn't mean to ramble on there, but I'm excited. I'm excited to talk art. Like I'm, I'm really the last few get like the last couple weeks we've had on, we've had, we've had on some great guests. They were just here. Great artists to talk art and that's what we do on this channel and that's the thing that gets me the most excited and uh we're gonna dive into that so i'm gonna throw the show to sean i'm gonna handle the chat for a little bit and we're gonna get rolling sean sounds good uh again like i was saying before the show what's your origin what got you in the comics what 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 inspires you to get to the drawing table every day to create <sighs> well where do i begin um <laughs> i uh you know, as a kid, I always drew from as far back as I can remember. And uh, I was, you know, from my era, you know, I grew up, really grew up in the 70s. I was a young adult in the 80s. and the 60s, I was a little tiny kid. I was born in, you know, 64. So I didn't really get to experience the Silver Age of comics or any of that stuff. But I did see it in, in retrospect, you know, once I, uh, once I got a little older in the 70s and the uh, when I first discovered comics, I don't know, I was 11 or 12 years old. I, I, I went from, you know, drawing the Flintstones and Popeye to just being obsessed with comic books. And then, so I, I just sort of got my attention and my focus was all geared into becoming a comic book artist. And, um, some of the guys that, that, I don't know, I was about, you know, 76, when I was, I was 12 in 1976. So you start becoming a little bit more aware of who drew what and, right. and uh, who your favorite characters were and all that kind of stuff. And I had discovered Wrightson and um, yeah. on, uh, Swamp Thing retroactively. But I, at that time in 76, he was working for Warren Magazine. So I would see a bunch of his creepy and eerie stuff, mm -hmm. which was right. you know the best comic book stuff he ever did. So and then I went back and just just rediscovered uh, Swamp Thing and all those kind of things. But I became obsessed with Wrights and, and uh, Neil Adams and Barry Smith to a lesser extent, but still, you know, his Conan work. And all those guys were off doing, you know, they, they had used comics as a springboard and then kind of went into doing their own self-publishing and portfolios and prints and, and mm -hmm. books and things like that. And I, that was kind of how I charted my life. You know, I was like, okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to get in comics, going to be a huge name. And then I'm going to jump in and do what these guys are doing. And um, yeah. I got, uh, I don't know, I got to about my sophomore year in high school and I would always been a huge film fan as well as a, you know, comic fan. And uh, we had a, we had an English instructor who was like really big into film and he had started a film program at my high school. So I started taking those classes my sophomore year through my senior year. And by the senior year, I had made a film with a few friends of mine and, and nice. we had won a regional award. So I started thinking film school and uh, long story short, I ended up at USC film school in the mid eighties after, um, you know, going to school for one year in a traditional sense and not doing that great <laughs> thinking re thinking reevaluating going to community college getting my grades back up and then uh ended up at usc film school for three years and then um funny thing is when i got through all that and i was in the the process of trying to you know make it in hollywood you find out that it, it's not easy <laughs> <laughs> right and, go figure and, yeah exactly can you imagine and you know you, you you think about getting a production assistant job on a film and, and they were paying like 250 dollars a week living in la even in the in the mid to late 80s that was nothing right. and uh right yeah so it was like you're like it was really difficult to find 
to break in and actually make enough money to make a living and work your way up. So I got frustrated with the whole process and thought, you know, maybe comics weren't such a bad idea after all. <laughs> and uh, so after not drawing for almost my entire college career, because I mean, it took some art classes just, you know, to kind of keep connected, but that really wasn't my focus was drawing. So I had really sort of retarded my skills so that, mm. you know, there was, it was 18 year old Lopresti and now I'm, you know, getting out of film school and I'm whatever, 24 and thinking right. about comics. And I hadn't really drawn for a lot for six years, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm this 24 year old with 18 year old skills. And so then it just took me a process and a while to kind of get ramped up and get back into it and figure out, you know, uh, how I could get good enough to, to pursue comics. And, um, what I did was I, I, I left LA, moved back to Oregon where I'm originally from, from, unfortunately moved in with my parents again, which was, you know, that seems to be Always like fun, a badge yeah. of honor these days, but back then that was, <laughs> right. True. And you True. never wanted to run into anybody at a store and then say, Hey, Aaron, what are you doing? Oh, I'm living with my folks. I'm unemployed. You know, that wasn't your roommates a badge of honor. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I finally hooked up with a commercial arts studio in the Portland area back when they still had those things. And, you know, we do storyboards and newspaper and magazine ads, things like that. And um, all the while, while I was doing this, I was trying to break into comics. So I would like every six months, I would you know, save up my money every six months. I would go fly back to New York for a few days and, you know, go and bug Marvel and DC, show my portfolio and that whole process for, um, thank you. Appreciate that, man. That's um, awesome. And that went on for uh, a couple of years. I, I eventually showed a portfolio at San Diego um, to Terry Cavanaugh, who was an editor at Marvel. Okay. And he was editing Marvel Comics Presents, if you guys remember that title really? from the 90s. Yeah. And so they were like, and they were pumping that thing out every two weeks. Mm -hmm. right? And so they need, and there was, you know, three stories in every comic. And so they needed people, just warm bodies. Right. And uh, so he looked at my portfolio and he, he said, uh, you know, I might be able to use you on Marvel Comics Presents at some point. And I thought that That's is, awesome. I'm hired. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Greatest know, thing no. ever. We're staying. Yeah. yeah. You know, We're staying. There, there was no internet or anything. Right. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm calling Marvel all the time and you know, you're not getting anywhere. Right. So that's when I said, I started saving up and saying, well, I'm going to need to go back there and sort of reestablish myself. And I got, I got to be friends with the receptionist at Marvel. You know, I had very, I knew what I was doing. I was like, okay, she's the one who opens the door. I got to get in good with her. Sure. So uh, she started, once I got to know her and, you know, she kind of like had pity on me, you know, my whole situation. <laughs> she would, I would go and without an appointment and there's all these people sitting in the lobby and she would just buzz me in. So I get my little Marvel sticker and she'd buzz me in. I'd go in nice. and then I would just wander around the offices until I saw an editor with the door open. And then I'd go in and bug him until they kicked me out. And um, eventually, you know, I was bugging Kavanaugh so much. I was like, yeah, I remember you told me at, you know, San Diego last year that blah, 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 you know. And so he finally, you know, threw me uh, some work. And it was in um, What The. I don't know if you guys remember that. Yeah, humor. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The humor, doing, yeah. Parodying their own characters. Mm -hmm. yep, so I started, yep. I started writing and drawing Forbish Man stories. That's my dog. Sorry. Nice. Um, Got to have the dogs involved. I love it. Yeah. Um, so I started writing and drawing Forbish Man stories in this uh, anthology. And then Renee Witterstadter eventually took over the book. And then so she became my editor. And I did that for probably two years while I was working at the commercial arts studio. And I finally thought I got in to where I was going to do a regular book. And that was um, they were giving me um, She-Hulk after Byrne left. And this was Renee Witterstadter giving it to me. Mm -hmm. And then uh, John Romita Sr., who was the art director there, was like, now nah, this guy's not ready for prime time yet. He needs you know, to work on his... And he's right. He's absolutely right. But you don't want to hear that, right? right. When you're yeah. this young guy, you're finally getting this... It's always break. a crushing thing to hear. But most yeah. of the time, it's right. You it's know? for your best, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so about that time, Malibu was launching Ultraverse, right? 
Nice. Yeah. Going nuts. It's like a full moon or something. Um, <laughs> so Shelly's out there going quiet. He's on TV, <laughs> you know? um, but anyway, uh, so they were trying to get me to come over and do the Ultraverse. Well, when I found out I wasn't going to get She-Hulk, I got really ticked off. And I said, well, screw you guys. Oh. I'm going over here. And the interesting thing is Malibu offered me, let me see, at the time I was doing, I was getting paid, I think, $85 a page for pencils at Marvel. Mm -hmm. maybe maybe 75 somewhere in that neighborhood okay they came in and offered me 135 a page oh holy like, hell. yeah done score and yeah, yeah right. so, so i just i left uh you know just walked away from marvel and, and went and uh did the ultraverse and that was what 93 i think and uh well i started in 92 it started getting published in 93 i think and he did some um, amazing spider-man stuff with bagley when when he was uh uh was it bi-weekly or they were doing twice a month, I think? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was the first Marvel stuff I uh, – the stuff, the, the straight stuff, you because the, not the humor stuff, but sure. the regular superhero stuff that I got. And it's funny, backtracking a little bit, um, Renee Witterstatter was really good friends with Michael Golden, and she still is. And – but so I, she started putting me up when I would go to New York, and I'd stay in her apartment and, you know, go into the Marvel offices. Well – Golden, I don't know. I think he may might have been worried that I was, you know, hitting on Renee or whatever, you know. So he was <laughs> over there all the time. So that gave me the opportunity to like pick his brain, right? Oh, so I was talking yeah. to Golden all this yeah. time. He was art director at DC at the time. And so he went over my stuff and basically told me what was wrong with it. This is why you're not getting work, you know. And we went through and it for the first time in my life, it actually made sense because you have editors will tell you stuff, right? And some it, a lot of times you're like, I'm not sure what you're telling me. You know, I'm not sure what you're saying. You know, right. it used to be more gritty. You're like, well, what does that mean exactly? <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. So he like it, it just like the bells went off, right? So that I I would always go in the middle of the week, stay the weekend, and then leave in the middle of the next week. You know, on these trips. Mm -hmm. So I had the weekend there, and based on what Golden had told me, I went and redid. Uh, or I did some new sample pages like over the weekend, like a three page uh, Wolverine Hulk thing. Oh, nice. And made it super dynamic, you know, and you know, this kind of stuff. And so then Renee took me in to, to meet with Danny Fingeroth. I showed him the stuff and that's when he gave me those Spider-Man backups. And so okay. I did a ton of those. And I, I will say, I think I got fired twice by him and I kept, <laughs> no, because it was weird because I, I got the job and I was, it was like, it was, it was like the weight of the world was suddenly on my shoulders. I'm like, I'm working for Marvel. That and bet. I just, I was like, this has got to be great. You know, and I just talked myself in doing, into doing some of the worst work of my life. Psyched yourself and, up uh, too much. Yeah. 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 I just, the pressure was too much. And yep. so he would go, you know, Aaron, I just don't think you're getting it, man. I, I don't think I can use you anymore. And I'd go, okay, I understand. I said, let me do a couple more samples. I think I've got figured out. And so then I would do samples at home under no pressure, send them in pretty good samples and send them into him and you go, okay, yeah, you've got it. And then he would give me another job. And mm. so that went on. And and finally, I, you know, I did like a dark Hawk annual and things like yeah. that. And the she Hulk thing came up and then, uh, so I was, I was building my way up at Marvel, but I really got ticked off about the she Hulk thing. So when the Malibu opportunity came, opportunity came and it was for considerably more money, mm -hmm. yeah. I took it. And the great thing about Ultraverse stuff was, I had no, I had no pressure at all. These guys were not on my back. They said, do whatever you want to do. Uh, we're happy to have you kind of thing. Nice. And they were incredibly supportive. You know, it was almost like working for your mom, you know? And <laughs> nice. so I was able to finally do what I thought was probably my first really sort of professional level work, which was sludge. Yeah. The monster book for them. Yeah, I remember and, sludge. Um, yeah. and then it was just like, a, and even after that, you know, which I had, a modicum of success. I got into wizard magazine because of it and all this mm -hmm. stuff. And I thought, okay, I'm in. Right. But then when Malibu went under, I kind of found myself searching again. Right. And I, I people at Marvel kind of pissed at me still at that point. So you know, I was over trying to get into DC and Valiant. I got a couple jobs here and there and it just, you know, it was very sort of hit or miss. I couldn't really get any attraction. And uh, finally, I'm sorry, you did some, some Exo Manware covers, right? Uh, what did I do? Um, no, I did Turok. I did a Turok cover and a Turok story over there. Um, God, I don't think I did any EXO 
covers. I was tripping. I tripping. I thought, so. I thought it was excellent. I apologize. No, no, no. Oh, that's fine. Um, I did the one issue of Turok where I did the cover and the, the interiors, and I did a couple pinups. I did a Turok pinup and then a Visitor. I don't know if okay. you remember that character. Yeah, yeah, kind of the red, uh, big yellow eyes. Yeah, he was like an alien, hmm. but he was like yeah. a Batman, but he was an alien. Kind yeah, of thing. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did a pinup for that, and that was, I think about it for Val. Oh, I did, no, I did Solar. I did like three issues of Solar, okay. Man of the Atom. That's yeah. what it was, and I did three covers. I did the covers and the interiors for those. And, um, but I finally got offered this book called Tachyon over at DC. And he's, uh, Byrne, John Byrne actually took him later and put him in with the new gods. Hmm. But, so we did this series and it was so bad. It got canceled after like seven issues. And uh, Paul Kupperberg was writing it. And um, I actually thought my artwork on it was pretty good. It was the best stuff I'd done at that time in my career. But the word on the street is that he, uh, was, he was an editor at DC working as a writer for another editor. And the editor was telling me, uh, look, you know, this, this fights, this, this, this scene kind of blows, you know, go in and do whatever you want. So I would, you know, I'd go into this big fight scene or whatever and just reorchestrate the whole thing, send it in. P Kupperberg was pissed, but the editor was like, yeah, this is better. And, and so, what I heard through the grapevine was that because after this got canceled, I couldn't get any work. I couldn't get arrested. And uh, what I heard was that uh, Coverberg was telling people, I don't know, maybe he's watching the show right now and he'll deny it. But what I heard <laughs> was that he was telling other people around DC that, you know, that this was my fault. It wasn't his fault. Mm. He's the book stunk. And so anyway, I basically got blacklisted at DC. So I went about three months without work and, finally weaseled my way back in at Marvel. And uh, I had been doing some stuff for Image. I know someone asked earlier, they wanted to know about the Gen 13 stuff. And um, I, I, Scott Dunbeer was, well, first of all, the guy that was editor in chief there before Scott was, oh, I can't think of his name, but he lettered my, uh, what the stories. So I knew it. Right. And so I'd call him up and go, dude, anything, anything. So I'd get some pinups and some card art and things like that. And then Scott Dumbier took over. And I knew I'd known Scott since he was an art dealer for years. And he's the one who I, you know, I, I pitched him the Gen 13 bootleg story, which he gave me. And, you know, I got some other work from Scott that sort of kept me floating mm -hmm. uh, until I hooked back up with Marvel. And uh, I told you this is a long origin story because there's like no, no end. This, this, actually, this actually is great. Let me interrupt just real quick because we got uh, Sumo Thor just became a member of the channel and he gifted five memberships picked up by uh, Jay from Desolate Souls, Jim Cox, Peter Palmiati, uh, Riddle Box, and Robert Frank. Thank you, brother. Thank you, you definitely brother. welcome to the Superior Court. No! <laughs> Thank you, brother. I appreciate <laughs> you, man, so much. That is so awesome. So sorry to interrupt, everybody. I got no, no, I got to no, call out the. Uh, like I said, it's like one run-on sentence. But I'm trying yeah. to get to the point where there, I can say, and then I succeeded, and I'm still trying to figure that part out. But so <laughs> I had got in and finally was doing some X Men stuff at the X Men office, right? And uh, I had done. I don't know. I I did a a wizard magazine uh, exclusive ult ultimate X-Men book that Danny Mickey inked. It really was killer. Oh, Jeff Johns wrote no, it. Man. It was really, really nice. And then um, I did three issues, I think in a row for them as fill ins. And I had Mark Morales inking me and those look great. Oh, wow. And uh, so they, Pete Franco, the assistant editor there said, called me up and said, Aaron, we really like what you're doing. In fact, we want you to take over X-Men. You're going to be the next big X-Men artist. So you can imagine I was just like freaking out doing backflips and saying, this is it. I've made it, right? right? Honey, we're getting a BMW. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, like this is it. Made the big Less time. Less than Holy a shit. week later, both of them got fired. Oh, man. And that was it. And I oh. had nothing. I had nothing again. And that's when I ended up at CrossGen and... I know you wanted to talk about CrossGen, so I'll just skip over this real quick and then we can go sure, back if sure. you want. But after CrossGen, we had all done really good work at CrossGen. And mm -hmm. it was like a melting pot for guys that were either starting out or 
that have been rejected by the industry to kind of resuscitate our careers. And most mm. of us did it that were in there. And so I ended up getting back in at Marvel um, for about four or five years after cross gen and then jumped over to DC for, you know, 12 years after that. So um, that's kind of the long and short of it, but it was a slog trying to break in and get regular work and uh, maintain that work it was really a challenge. <clears throat> the thing I'm hearing is determination. Like, don't quit. Yeah. Like, like there's mm -hmm. a lot of young uh, upcoming artists. It's you. You may not get that break here or there, but you just gotta keep on. It. Like, take the shot. Just put in the work and just don't give up on your dreams. That's what that's right. Happened. EVS got those guys fired, and I remember <laughs> I didn't know that. I was at a show in oh the, the sex thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, not the, not not yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the hidden, yeah, yeah. The hidden the, thing, the hidden thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. He, he was, right. You know, for him personally, he had reasons to dislike these guys, but it yeah. just so happened that it ended up crushing my career. <laughs> oh, that's that's just crazy. But I was sitting next to him at a con in Phoenix, and he was telling the story about how he got uh, Pete Franco and um, oh the other gentleman that was the 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 lead editor got him fired by writing this the stuff in the the panels, right? And I went, you're the guy who cost me my career. And he's like, what? And so I told him the whole story. And of course he was like, hey, you're doing okay. You know? <laughs> I'm like, ah, you'd be fine. But yeah, so I mean, you laugh about it now. Cause I mean, obviously he didn't do anything to he purposely, you know, hurt my career. Yeah. He, was, he had a problem. Yeah, with for sure. They were it's working just out. small world. Weird yeah, how things work just, out. Yeah. So that was kind of funny, but, um, so yeah, so that, uh, it, cross gen actually was what saved basically saved my career because I was able to go in there and and really do my the best work of my career, which got me noticed again. So I you know it worked out okay. That just seemed like a cool experience because I, I remember I was like 18 at the time and like you saw the ads in Wizard say, Can you draw? Or you whatever said in your stuff, and I'm like, I'm not that good. Oh, with cross gen? But, yeah, but just the whole idea of it, like like the the studio environment you had your penciler you had your inker you had your writer in the other office you had the colorist right there that's the whole cubicle thing and i remember buying some dvds of like motion comics type of deal mm -hmm. and then they had studio tours in the back of them there's only the same thing like over and over again yeah. and i just feel like wow this is so cool and like bruce blitz was there that he interviewed andy and I, I i was at a show with bruce like maybe like seven years ago i'm like oh i, I watched it on youtube he's like you're the only one you're but it seemed like one. such a cool <laughs> experience, you know. It, like it was, it was, it was weird because if you're, you know, been a freelancer your whole life, which I've been, I was either a student and then went right into freelancing, and you know, I'm still to this day. So you, there, you're at Cross Gen, where you're basically they set it up to work like a nine to five job. Yeah, and you got a salary, you got, you got benefits, you got vacation. I mean, it was really bizarre wow. and in a weird way because they, you couldn't work at least the beginning, you couldn't work freelance for them. You had to move to Florida and mm -hmm. work in the, the studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I really had to twist Shelly's arm cause she wasn't you know, happy about that. But um, so we went and did that and um, you know, you, you, you sort of become friends with, everybody in the studio that becomes your friend group right because they're, you, you're in a new place you don't know anybody else sure I, I kept thinking it felt like you know that tom cruise movie the firm you know the uh, john grisham oh really movie, yeah. you know, you, uh, there wasn't anything weird going on other than <laughs> us making comics but it kind of had okay. that weird you know kind of in because we'd all picnic together and we'd have these you know mm. everybody would hang out together because we didn't know anybody else we were none of us were from that area so um but we, you know, you're in, you're sitting there and, you know, Mike Perkins was on one side of me. Um, I think it was, I don't know if Andy was in the same cubicle as I was or not. I can't remember. I think he was. And then um, Steve, uh, oh geez, did um, Epting mm. was on the other side of me. And it was like, you know, so you got all these guys sitting there wanting to do their best work. Um, unless you were Steve McNiven, he didn't move down to Florida. Oh, he did. I thought he, I thought he did the he uh, the apprentice program. I thought hmm. he was there for a while. He may not have stayed very long. He wasn't there in house when I got there, but I think he was there at the beginning okay. and then left. Um, but you know, Jimmy Chung was in there, and so there's a lot of really good um, talent. Jeff Johnson talent. was there. Um, 
And so you you wanted to do better than the guy sitting next to you, right? Oh, so we course. were all really focused. And we all, I think all of us ended up doing the best work of our careers there. And then, of course, when it, if, the way it was set up, you knew if you had any experience, which I did, you knew it, financially it wasn't going to work. It was just too much money going out and not enough money coming in. You know, that's right. why that's why you have people work as freelancers. So you don't have to pay them, uh, you know, health insurance. Mm -hmm. and you don't have to give them paid vacation. And they True. only get paid for what they do, that kind of thing. And, and this was totally different. It was great, but I knew it wasn't going to last because we just, even our best-selling book, which was, I think, Sojourn, was, you know, low 20s, right? Yeah. And I was... And then we had some that were down, you know, 15. Most of them were in between 15 to 20. So they were decent, decent average numbers if they had just, if we'd all been freelancers and living at home, right? But the, right. the overhead and everything, they're just, we, they weren't generating enough money. And I kind of knew that was going to happen, but I figured, oh, if I can get two years out of this, it'll be worth it. And that's about exactly what I got out of it. Uh, Do you think that was a marketing thing? Like a marketing issue? Like not, not enough people were getting eyes on the book or knowing about, no the project down there. Or the I think it was because he, Mark Alessi did a, a really was very diligent about pushing it. You know, we had a huge present presence at conventions and, but we were a, when you're, when you can't compete with the superhero market, like Marlon and DC owns the superhero market, mm -hmm. right? That's just the way. Right, it is. Right. And so if you open up a new co company and you try and do superheroes, you're going to fail. So what do you have to do? You have to do everything else that is not superheroes, which is fantasy, mm. science fiction. That's the kind of stuff we were doing. But the flip side of that is there's a limited audience for that. Yeah. I think it's bigger now, you know, through uh, Comicsgate and other things where you've got so many people that are fed up with mainstream. They're looking for something different. Right. right. So, But again, if we were a company producing, you know, 20 books a month or something, we'd probably, we'd, we'd have the same issues. Right. And so I just don't think there was enough people to support it, enough fans, enough readers to support it, at least at the numbers that they needed to make their overhead. And, yeah. um, <clears throat> but I think everybody knew about them and everybody knew they were good quality books, but it's oh, like yeah. trying to pry someone away from Spider-Man, you know, to read, uh, Mystic. Right whatever it is a challenge especially if at that time the marvel books and the dc books were good you know so mm -hmm. it was like now we're competing you know now they're not for generally speaking they're not right so like, yeah. that's better for us but back then it was like they were peaking you know they were doing great stuff and everybody was reading it and they were very popular and and here we are the startup company crossgen trying to pull the readership away or at least get them to spend part of their money on these crossgen books and like I said, we had a pretty loyal following of about 15,000 to 25,000 every month on any one of these given books. But you start expanding, you start expanding mm -hmm. and too quickly, which they did. Mm -hmm. and again, you everybody's got, we have these great health benefit packages, which were awesome. You know, I sure. never had that before in my life. And yeah, uh, that would have been that would have been sweet. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's got this huge, you know, warehouse basically that we're all housed in, and he's paying rent on that and electricity wow. and everything for that. And then you've got then he had office employees as mm -hmm. well. We didn't have editors, but there was the you know, he had a couple of receptionists, we had some people that did the that took care of the the healthcare stuff. It was a lady, and I think another guy that did that, and then there was some other people in the office and and so, um, you know, so he had all these salaries he was paying out, plus all of us were on salary. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was just like I said, it just wasn't a financial um, uh, plan that was going to work in comics because it never has. They've never done that in comics, right? It's yeah. always been freelance, even at its inception, comics were freelance. So um, that eventually just, you know, did him under. It was a ballsy move to make everything so cohesive and intertwined within each other, uh, story-wise, or, or trying to. And cool, but like you said, like yeah. they kept doing more books and more books. It's like it's kind Try of hard to, to keep too fast, up. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was a tremendous creative experience because, first of all, we didn't have any editors, mm -hmm. and editors nowadays are, seem to be very young and inexperienced, and you know, and 
it wasn't like back in the day where you had these like Archie Goodwin and guys like that that really knew what they were doing, right? right? And so we sort of eliminated the editors. And what they had was the writers would get together and have writers meetings and everybody would bring their script and they would basically edit each other. Right. Oh, okay. And so then the writers would come out and say, okay, this is what we're doing. And then I would meet with the, my writer who was in this case with mystic was Tony Bedard. And I'd go into his office and we would talk about, you know, the script and then, Hey, what did I want to add to it? If anything, and, or do you have some ideas that I can incorporate that kind of thing? And so he would always, you know, incorporate some of the stuff I wanted to draw in there to make it more fun for me. Right. And then, sure. then I would go and draw the book and I'd hand it to my anchor who was Matt Ryan, who's terrific. And I said, you know, I'd say, Matt, this is what I'm going for here. You know, I could just like literally walk over to his desk right. and say, this is that's, what I'm going for. That's cool. And then he'd ink a page and I'd come over and look at it and go, yeah, that's great. That's exactly it. Or, Hey, how about try this? And so we had complete control over it. And then it would go over to the colorist who was sitting just in the other cubicle right mm -hmm. next to me. And I'd say, this is what I had in mind for this scene. Do this or, you know, and then he would do whatever. And I'd say, yeah, that looks great. Uh, how about change this to that? And so you had all this stuff, all, all this talent was just right there so we could communicate with each other yeah. and come out with the best product possible. And we did. The books were great. Beautiful stuff the, the, from, from the pencilers, the inkers, the colors. Your color department was, was nasty. Like you, like you guys were like Marvel and DC were, were chasing you guys at the time because there was some top notch shit coming yeah, out. Yeah, Laura Martin was there. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, just trying to, I, uh, uh, I can't even see. No, I'm, I'm forgetting other people's names. So <laughs> watch this going. Thanks a lot, Aaron, for forgetting me. But oh, we, had, real, we had great colorists there, mm -hmm. uh, really good pencilers, and uh, really good anchors. I mean, we just had really good talent there. And um, it just, it's unfortunate that it didn't, uh, it wasn't able to sustain itself. Uh, real quick, I just want to give some shout outs to some of the members that jumped in the channel that I didn't get to earlier. We have uh, RJ, member of the channel, uh, Sheldon Martin, member of the channel. We have Henry, who, uh, oh, actually, he's got a question marked in there, but Josh, 1945, uh, the green laser, and a new member gifted by Sumo Authority, Jim Cox. Welcome Good to, see to you, the Jim. chat, guys. Good, Good to see you guys. See you. Uh, also, Clayton's in the house, the man, the myth, the legend. Uh, everybody, go check out his new book. Uh, Borak, Borak, did I pronounce that right? But it looks awesome. It's nice. Looks awesome. Looks awesome. All right, on with the show. Sorry, I just had to do some. Uh, no, that's some hey, management hey, of the. I know how it there. goes. <laughs> I know how it goes. Um, I saw Cullen in here in the chat. Says Aaron's favorite subject: yesteryear. Yesteryear. He's right. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta reminisce. You know, I, 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 rem I reminisce probably way too much. But, the good old days. Yeah, the good know? old days. Now, yeah. cross gen. So when I was into comics before, and I've been in and out of comics a couple of different times throughout um, my life. Mm -hmm. But like you said, the superhero market. Like I was really big into, you know, what Marvel and D DC to a certain extent. But what Marvel was doing and then what Image was doing, they had their superhero universe in the '90s that they were creating. So right. yeah, that must have been really hard with that kind of market, you know, being saturated. Like you had those three primarily the two, but you had those three just like soaking up the superhero movies or the superhero comics. And I saw somebody was a Bretsky, the great, I think said the world or the industry was not ready for non superhero books at the time. And maybe mm -hmm. it would be more yeah. success nowadays where it's a little bit more open for uh, that kind of content real quick. Jim Cox gifted five memberships to the channel. Thank you, brother. Thank you. man. Um, you we go. got you Cullen, go. Jeremy, uh, Chris 827, MPC Oasis, and Cos Cosmic Studios, and all this all picked up memberships. Uh, welcome, guys. Uh, that definitely gets a, a Dr. Fishy. Dr. Fishy! No! You see, and Bob. Remember, you are my number one. <laughs> welcome and thank you so much brother i appreciate you thank you for the support mm -hmm. everyone <laughs> that's great that never gets old i love that i just i love that jack nicholson you making fun of jack palance it was i wonder how palance felt about that i 
I want like that had to have been in the movie, right? Like they had to have like written that into the script, unless it was just mm. something that was ad libbed. I read no, well, the, the line is in there, but I think Jack Nicholson doing a parody of Jack Palance was he did that on his own. <laughs> was my See, understanding. That's great. If that's the case, okay. that's that's great. He just <laughs> I'm that. kind of curious what uh, what Palance thought of it. He's got Jack <laughs> Nicholson making fun of him <laughs> on screen, you know. That that book, that comic is still one of the best uh, movie update adaptation illustrated comic books ever, ever. You know, Jerry Ordway, they flew him out while they were filming that movie, and he was like there with the actors in the sound stage, so really? he could get their likenesses and stuff like that. So, oh, for doing the DC, yeah, yeah, doing the, the, the novel, the graphic a lot novel, and making that good. Oh, he did he a great was. job. Uh, yeah, did he, he do the? Script. Did he do uh, returns too? Batman Returns. I don't, I don't remember. remember. I'll have to remember. I just know he did the, the first one. Yeah, I just I remember that both those both the graphic novel comics adaptions of those movies were fantastic. I remember mm -hmm. as a kid picking them up and uh, reading them quite a bit and just falling in love because I was a huge you know Batman Batman Returns fan when I was you know a little kid. But uh, yeah, Chris says uh, Nicholson is still my favorite Joker. I love his portrayal of Joker. Mm -hmm. Like it was still to to this day probably my favorite. Yeah, Bob Gunn. Yeah, <laughs> the best. Poor Bob. Love Bob, but poor yeah. Bob in that movie. Uh, I remember getting the toys as a kid. I'm like, why well, do I think it's this bald guy? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants the bald guy actually. Nah, nah. Says. Um, Aaron, you had said something interesting. You were talking about uh, going through film school, mm -hmm. which is, is really cool uh, because that's always something I've, I've been really fascinated in, in myself. But do you, have you noticed that doing that and learning how to tell a story – through film um, helped with like pacing and telling stories sequentially with, with art. Well, it's funny what I got more out of film school was the writing aspect um, and how to how, telling a story in terms of not how you do it visually, but how you do it in terms of the elements that you need to include, what you need to show, what you don't need to show to make a, you know, a scene clear. Those are the kind of things because you get in there and you film stuff. And then you go into the editing room, right? And you're saying, okay, well, I got to cut this down to X amount of minutes. So right. what can I leave in? What can I take? What can I take out and leave in to still, so I get the story across, but I'm doing it succinctly. I'm doing it efficiently and not just being um, self-indulgent. Right. And yeah. that was always the challenge because uh, it, it was weird because UCLA was set up one way and USC was set up like a studio system. OK, UCLA was more, hey, you know, if you can scrape together ten thousand dollars, you can make an epic if you want, you know, <laughs> or if you know. But at USC, it was like they didn't care how rich you were, how much money your parents had. You had to operate under these parameters like you were mm. working for a studio. So, you okay. had, you know, like we had our, our second year film projects, which were uh, was 310 was the you know, was the, the course number it was 310. And. They were, uh, you'd get a partner, you'd partner up with somebody and one of you would shoot half inch video and the other one would shoot 16 millimeter film. Right. Huh. And so uh, I shot the film on mine and my partner did his film and video. But what we did was you were, you had to bring it in at eight minutes. It had to be eight minutes long, eight or maybe it was nine. I can't remember. Okay. Well, my cut on my last film or my, my film my final film was 13 minutes. Right. Mm. And I was not going to budge. You know, I was like one of those guys. Right. right. And um, integrity. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Artistic integrity. And they, they, yeah. they would, they would always preach this balance between, yeah, there's artistic integrity, but it's a business. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like comic books. You either do hit the deadline or you get fired unless, you know, right. or unless you're so fantastic that they, they will let you bleed along for a unless while. Unless you're bringing in lots of money. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So they really pushed that. And what happened was they would do this. And, and I, I'm surprised more people weren't at each other's throats, but they would, they would set your partner against you. Okay. Because your grade was tied in together. Okay. So if I said to my partner, John, I said, this is, I'm doing 13 minutes. I don't give a rip about my grade. And he's like, well, I give a rip about my grade. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so the teacher would go, well, because my partner edited my film and I edited his film. Oh, okay. Oh, so gotcha. I gotcha. Could not interfere with him editing. So if he was told to cut it, he cut it. And so 
you had to sort of, you had to be able to work with your, your guy and say, okay, I know they told you to cut it. All right. So what can we cut? Even though you didn't want to cut it. Right. Yeah. But the funny thing is you start trimming a little scene here, there, here, there, pretty soon it's down to nine or 10 minutes and it moves quicker and you still have the same story. Right. But you, right. you get so involved as the director and the, the writer and the director that you're like, oh, no, this scene needs to be this long because we're taking in the, you know, it's just be Yeah, RC farsi bullshit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so he cut the film and got it down to, I think it was 30 seconds or a minute longer than it was supposed to be. And we finally got my teacher to go, okay, because he thought it was pretty good. And so, nice. and there, there, it was amazing when I let this guy just cut it after we talked and it came back in and he had an objective opinion, right? He wasn't married to it like I was, mm -hmm. it wasn't his baby. And he said, okay, just from the outside looking at this thing, this would actually work better if we trim this and trim this It'd move better. And he was right. You know, it did move better. It was still overly long because we got to a point where we'd actually have to cut story out to make mm -hmm. it work. Gotcha. Yeah. But so that's the kind of stuff that I learned at film school was what's necessary. What isn't necessary don't let this scene drag on too long. Get out of there. Get, make your point and move to the next scene kind of thing. Um, because visually, you know, if you look at like the Batman television show, for example, right, from 1960s, right? Yeah. There's all these Dutch angles and, you know, yeah. never. They would not let us do that in film school. They're just like, no, that that takes it takes the viewer out of the movie hmm. experience, right? Because now they're looking at the camera angle instead of what you're setting in front mm -hmm. of them. Okay. You know, so we got to be really good at what they'd call mise en scène, which is just basically moving in, in front of the camera, creating depth within the shot rather than moving the camera, but moving the actors. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I got out of film school and then went back trying to get into comics, my sensibilities were way different than they were when I went in. I was less dynamic, actually, uh, because we didn't do these outrageous shots in film school, right? That you would do in comics, you know, how right. Neil Adams would, you know, take a low angle shot from the, and the guy's foot was in camera and the punch would be all the way at the far end of the panel and just bizarre things like you'd never do that in a, in a movie. Yeah. So I was looking at stuff very cinematically and I had to go back and actually start like reading Jim Lee comics and McFarlane and those guys okay. Okay. get my, get my dynamics back. In fact, I looked at, like I saved all my artwork from when I was a kid Nice. And I would go back and look at stuff I did in fifth grade, and it was more dynamic and interesting, the layouts, than what I was doing when I got out of film school <laughs> because I had lost that whole sort of Jack Kirby sort of comic book language, and it had turned into film language, which is very different. Right. And um, so I sort of had to relearn dynamics, but it did. It made a huge difference in my storytelling. Oh, did, you get, did you really get where you got line. the grade on for the, for the film? What was that? Do you remember what the grade was that you got? Oh, no, he didn't lower my grade. I, okay. uh, my That teacher didn't. Um, <laughs> oh, I, dude, I, I was in a <laughs> – they had these, like, senior projects, right? Yeah. They're called 410s. And, and that, or four, no, it doesn't matter. But 480. And uh, that, was, that, that was the difference between UCLA and USC. If you got to direct a 480 and they only did five of them a semester, and there was, like, I think there was 250 of us in the film school. And uh, so you weren't guaranteed that you'd get a reel to graduate with, right? You had to get one of these 480s, which was a 20 minute full color sync sound film. And, uh, but before you could direct one, you had to work on the crew. So these, mm -hmm. and you weren't even guaranteed that because you'd have to go in and interview with whoever the director got the pick to direct their film you'd have to go in an interview with them. Right. So um, I became an AD for my first time around assistant director. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And, you know, people would be a cameraman or uh, um, uh, director of photography, uh, you know, different, whatever. And um, so I was the AD and then I had another partner of mine who was a production manager. Right. And so we handled all the, uh, I handled more of the stuff on set and then we both sort of worked on setting up locations and things like that. And uh, so in that class, I, I'm very, I don't trust anybody to do anything. 
Facts. I assume they're going to screw it up. <laughs> yeah. And Good so, philosophy. Yeah, I do everything myself. I've always yeah. been that way, right? And it's really hard for me to pass stuff off to somebody else because <laughs> I'm always worried if they're going to get it done, right? Yeah. And so um, I didn't do a good job of relegating responsibility because we were supposed to like get the whole crew to help us do stuff. Sure. And they didn't want to do anything, right? Except for what their job was. Because the stuff we were doing was like getting food for the, you know, for the the crew as well oh. as we had food, as well as securing <laughs> locations and making sure that stuff was cleaned up at the end of the, you know, and organizing what was going on on the set. No one wanted to deal with that crap, right? Yeah. And so we ended up doing everything ourselves. And my instructor, I gave me a C in the class. And I was like, are you out of your freaking mind? I was in there like arguing wow. with him in his office. And he was like, your job is to get other people to do your work for you. And I went, what? I said, my <laughs> job is to get it done, which I did. He goes, yeah, but you did it all yourself. And I'm like, so? And he's like, yeah. So it wasn't about whether you did wow. the job or whether you even did it well, but it was how you got it done. And so he, he lowered my grade because I, I did everything myself. <laughs> That's crazy. Despite so they're the more, they're, not done. they're preparing you to be a manager at Wendy's. Yeah, well, no, it, like it, it seems like they're more worried about preparing you for like what the industry that you were going yes. to go into was calling mm. instead of yes. like the actual quality. Which it, it's interesting, but I can see their their kind of point of view. But yeah, it does kind of that would be maddening. Mm. You know, that would absolutely be maddening. I was yeah, because like, to me, it was just get the job done any way possible, right? Right. And so if that meant I did it myself. I do it myself because we did try and get guys to help us. And they were like, I'm not doing that, you know, or, oh yeah, we'll meet you there on Saturday and they wouldn't show up. So what are you supposed to do? Yeah. But we, yeah. that was my fault for not convincing them to that right. they needed to be there, you know, kind of thing. So. Hail the uh, Lord says, uh, how, how dare you have a good work ethic, Aaron? Yeah, I, know. I, know. I know. You didn't get rewarded for, you know, results. It was just how you got the results, I guess. But. Um, and then I, I never, the next year, the next semester, I, I didn't get the 480, right? Because you mm -hmm. go in the interview for that and you, everybody turns in scripts and all that kind of stuff. And so what people would do at USC is they would just keep hanging around, even though they were oh, really? graduated, they'd keep hanging around so they could get until they got a 480 so they could have a reel and go get an agent and, you know, have a gotcha. chance to get a director. Yep, I didn't gotcha. have the money or the resources. And so after one try and I didn't get it, I was out. And that's when I was like, I was reading scripts at TriStar and I was, uh, you know, looking for PA work, anything I could get. Mm -hmm. And then there was a writer's strike. So I ended up working, oh, I ended up working um, temporary work, right? But down in LA, temporary work is like, oh yeah, go down to the law offices of, uh, you know, so-and-so and you can work in the records department. You wear oh, really? a tie, you feel like you have a real job, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So it was actually, it was okay, but it, I wasn't furthering my career. And then at right. some point you just, and it felt like really sort of like, it's like, man, this could take years. And then you still might not, you know, get anywhere. Sure. So that's when I just said, yeah, I'm going to go back and try comics, which I thought would be much easier. And of course, is just as difficult. It's just a smaller, you know, different scale. Yeah, I was just going to say like anything when it comes to like the entertainment industry is so like so there's so much competition there's it's so hard to break in um i remember when i was trying to break in, in my early 20s into comics just going to conventions and showing my portfolio and doing all the stuff that i was told that you're supposed to do i would run into so many artists that were were great you know they'd they'd sit i'd sit down at the table they'd look at my stuff they'd give me pointers and tips and i, I ran into a lot of them that said they were like kind of tried to softly burst my bubble a little bit by of the industry and they're just like look dude Keep on doing what you're doing, but just just so you know, from our experience, it's not so much like how good you are; it's who you know. And they're oh, like, yeah. try to get contacts in the industry. Try to find yeah. people that you can get contacts through, uh, like editors and stuff. He's like, that's you know, these guys were like, that's how you can kind of make it. Yeah. You know, just going to the table and showing your work wasn't going to get you hired like it did maybe. 15 years before that, you know, it's who, you know, let me buy you a beer. Let me tell you what you like. Yeah. 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 Unless, unless you're just like, you know, next level, your stuff is right. just like, Oh my gosh, you're the next art Adams or, you know, Jim Lee or whatever. Yeah. But though, you know, most of us are not that right. right. Just, and so just being good was not enough. You know, it's like, why should they hire me instead of that guy? Well, because they know that guy, that guy yeah. went out to the party with them last night, bought him a beer or whatever. <laughs> right. And, that that's extremely that that that's really true. And I mean, 
I was able to, like I you know mentioned in my origin story, I was able to back in the day when you could go to Marvel and mm-hmm. you could get buzzed in mm-hmm. and you could wander around the office and bug people. I mean, I did that and that's how I got my connections and also got some people pissed at me, but I also made some friends while I was there because I was in the studio or in the office and they would recognize, oh yeah, there's Aaron again. Right. What do you got this time? And then you develop, develop a rapport with them. And so then they see your work and they're like, yeah, okay, it's good enough. Here, do this story. I have this inventory sit story sitting here. I need someone to do it. And he would get it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's what's really cool. True. <laughs> that's so true. Part one. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> it's it's really interesting because a lot of the, the origin stories or whatever that you hear uh, from guys that I grew up you know, loving in the 90s or even further back that got stuff did that. We're able to go to like, you know, I, I remember listening to an interview with uh, Joe Cusada. I think he was doing like a Kevin Smith podcast or something. He was just talking about how he broke into the industry. And that's one of the ways he did it. He would go to physically, he would go to Marvel and he would like pretty much bug people with samples all the time, get to know somebody. Uh, I wish I'd known that when I was a kid, although I don't think my parents would have ever let me go to New York. Stuck in Michigan, that's just what it was. You know, like (laughs) I wasn't getting a lot of people looking at my work. That's what happens when you live in Central America. (laughs) You know, I is, was yeah. flying in from Oregon for crying out loud, but yeah. uh, I was I was an adult, and so I was like, you know, it wasn't like I was a kid trying to to get in there. And I actually, when I was, I was eighteen, right? I was I was getting near the end of graduating from high school, and Archie Goodwin showed up at a comic shop in Portland, and uh, I had worked up these sample pages, right? And I w- had convinced myself that I was just a freaking genius and that I was going to go in there (laughs) and show Archie Goodwin these samples. And he was going to be like, uh, I stay out of Portland. Uh, but, um, (laughs) I was going to show him these samples and he was going to hire me. And so I was like telling my mom, you know, mom, I don't know if I'm ready to go to New York, but you know what? I'll do it if I have to kind of thing. You know, I was already had this planned up. And so I go and I meet the guy at the comic shop. I show him my portfolio. He looks through it and he goes, yeah, I don't, I'm not, you know, he goes, you should talk to other artists to get some feedback. He didn't give me any feedback. Not oh, only did wow. he say he didn't hire me, he didn't give me any feedback. He was just kind of like, eh, I don't really, you know, I don't really do this. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> was I had great, one bad, one you know, bad said, dumb idea at 21. Jim Lee was at um, a, a local New York show. It was right across from the garden. And mm-hmm. I did this pinup. And I'm going to ask Jim Lee to ink my pinup and then he's going to hire me. <laughs> so I'm like, are you, are you, are you doing, you know, can you, can you do this? He's like, no, nah, I got this charity thing. I'm like, fucking charity. But yeah, <laughs> that fell through. <laughs> well, like, I've told this story before, like when I was showing my work, again, I, I showed my work to a lot of artists, you know, and they were great, you know? So when I finally got the courage to, to go show an editor my work, you know, that was like the harsh reality of, <laughs> No more was anyone trying to give me a soft uh, pat on the back and, and instructions. I, I went to, I think it was a dark horse editor. I can never remember, but I showed them my work after just showing like this artist over here, my work and getting some really good encouragement and went over to this dude, showing the work. He like flipped through it in a couple of seconds and he handed it back to me. He was like, yeah, you shouldn't be showing anybody your work right now. It was the top like, cow guy. Can't draw. <laughs> I was just it, like, it was the oh, top cow shoot. guy. <laughs> it like crushed me. Like I was just Joey, like, oh man. It was the top gal guy. And I'm like, I Which, think that guy's not even an editor. I think he's just selling the t-shirts. Like, how do you know? Like they want badges and say, yeah, just behind that's true. the like, I, I don't know. Like it, you know, but yeah, that's that, so that was funny. Yeah, that but was it's so that true. Was I mean, it's happened that you every time anybody that's shown their portfolio has got that, that's for sure. At least one time or another. It's like yeah, well, uh, yeah, you really need to work on this crap, son. Get out of here. You know, like, <laughs> That's pretty uh, much what it was. I was like, yeah. oh, oh, okay. <laughs> like, yeah, so sorry to bother life. you, sir. Uh, no, uh, that, it, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna. I was just gonna say. I wanted to jump into uh, questions when we get into the uh, the next part of this because I know we had some questions racking up. And guys, I told you I tagged them all. So the questions I got in here, we will talk about it. But I wanted to bring up the uh, the first one that we did see earlier in the in the in the stream that aaron at or uh, mark asked to you um how you got on the gen 13 at wildstorm well i knew i knew scott dunbeer like i said when he was an art uh seller mm-hmm. and he had gotten the position of editor-in-chief over there so i called him up and i'm just like dude you know i need anything anything because i was like it had been like three months without work after that 
the wow. tachyon fiasco at DC, right? And I was trying, and uh, so he would like he'd throw me pinups and you know cards and things like that. And <clears throat> I come up with this. I knew they were doing Gen 13 bootleg, right? Which was the second Gen 13 title, and uh, I got Shelly doing the garbage. It's garbage. Oh, nice. <laughs> Sorry. No, I got to take it out though. She collects it though, and I appreciate that very that much. That's nice. That's, That's a great yeah. team. Um, yeah, good I'm teamwork. Sorry. I love it. Yeah, it's a team for sure. And um, so I knew that they were doing these, you know, solo Gen 13 stories. Um, <clears throat> but I knew they wouldn't, you know, hire me as a writer. Mm. I might be able to convince them to let me draw it because at that point I'd already done Sludge and I'd done, like I said, I'd done plenty of stuff in the industry. Right. It wasn't like I was, you know, this is my first job. And so, um, I had talked to Carl Kiesel, who was in the studio at the time with me, and I said, this is an idea I have. Would you be interested in you know, co-writing it with me? Because he, uh, he was doing Superman, I think he was doing Superboy, and he was, you know, he was, you know, Carl Kiesel was at, at the height of his popularity, and I thought, well, that, that'll get me in, right? Right. And, but he didn't have time to do it. So I, I said, okay, that's fine. So we had talked about some ideas. And so I just incorporated everything that I had. And then when we had talked about some of his ideas, incorporated them into the script. And I said, you're cool with me doing this on my own. He's like, yeah, fine, whatever. So I pitched it to, to Scott and he actually liked it because it was actually kind of a fun story. It was like, um, it was a combination of Island of, of Dr. Moreau and King Kong and Scooby-Doo. Nice. So you put all those elements <laughs> in there. Sounds fun. It, was, it was pretty fun. And so... Uh, he he wanted to go ahead and do it, but he's like, he goes, I can't put you on this book as the selling point because mm. it was supposed to be, they always, they had these big name people coming in doing these short Gen 13 stories, right? So I said, well, let me, let me talk to Walter Simonson, who I knew, and I said, see if he would do it. Name drop. Yeah, so I called, <laughs> up, I called up Walter and I'm like, hey, would you be interested in, you know, I said, look at all you have to do is dialogue it. I said, I've got the story written. I sent him the script. I said, it's all done. I just need your name on this so I can get the job. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> nice. And he said, okay, I'll, I'll dialogue it. And I said, great. Thank you. That's awesome. And That's so, so I, cool. So I went in there with, you know, I said, Hey, Walter's on board. So it was Simonson Lopresti now. Right. And uh, so that's how I got that two part gen 13 thing, which I penciled and inked and wrote. And then Simonson did the dialogue for the first issue and I sent him notes and stuff. So basically he used my dialogue with a few changes here and there. Nice. <laughs> and then he couldn't do the second issue. So he threw it over to Wheezy and I was like, and she's a terrific writer. Yeah. Uh, and she was even, she just took my script. I don't know if she put any new lines in there or not. She really? might've gone in and she may have edited it, you know, a little bit. Yeah. Neither one of them had time to do it, right? You know, yeah. so they're just like, Aaron, this is fine. We'll just put our name on it. And, you know, and they made a couple of changes here and there. That's and then up. so they, they, they're they credited as the writers on there. Um, and uh, but I think Walter, Walter did do the dialogue for the first issue that I did. But I don't know if if Wheezy, how much dialogue she actually wrote or if she just like used my script and made a couple changes and sent it back to me and. <laughs> You know, which is fine. I didn't care. It was like they were doing me a favor. So, you know, now, was this before or after the whole uh, the gag on you for uh, working for doing the Captain America for Extreme? Oh, Your buddy pr played a prank. Yeah, uh, it was Gary Martin, <laughs> the amazing prankster that he is. Um, well, let me I would think. Be pissed. I would have pissed. I would have whooped his ass. I would be so pissed. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was a little bit after. Okay that because i was yeah i mean i was still in the studio when i did that gen 13 thing but mm -hmm. i think this was after that yeah because i was this was probably we were in the studio together for two years then we moved locations for the like six months and then we were all just like at each other's throats and said okay we're done but um the first two years was pretty good and i think it was probably the first year that he did that because um, I was, that's when I was, I was doing Tachyon and then I, then Tachyon got canceled. And then I was kind of like, you know, in the negative zone <laughs> trying to, you know, pick up a thing yeah. here and there, which I did. I picked up little bits and things here and there. Um, you know, Terry Dodson got behind on something. So I would like 
help him finish an issue and things like that. And then that editor at Marvel would go, oh, hey, yeah, do this eight page backup story and that kind of thing. And so I think I think it was about that time. But it was so funny because if I had been clearly thinking, it's like, why would have anyone at Image called me to ask me to draw Captain America based on what? You know, I <laughs> right. wanted to believe it was true, right? And so then of course fool myself. But uh uh yeah, that was a uh, <laughs> was so I was so scary. It took me a while to get over that, but uh, uh, me too. Yeah, I, I would have been like it would have been something I would have been I would have held on to for a little while. I did <laughs> with that. But, uh, I, I got over it because it's like, what are you gonna do? I mean, he didn't right. he, he he didn't think it would get that far, you know. Oh, and really? The thing, the thing is. He, he had left the message on our message machine and I was out to lunch and I think it was Rachel Dodson who actually got retrieved the messages. So I didn't even, I never heard the message. Mm. She just said, Oh my gosh, this so-and-so from image called you about Captain oh. America. And I'm like, Holy crap. So I had no idea if I had heard the message, I might've recognized Gary's voice and known the whole right. thing was a gag, sure. but I didn't. And so, yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I laugh now in that kind of nervous, uncomfortable laugh because I, I really did a good job of humiliating myself. So it was. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you, you handled it well. I, I, you know, handled it with class is what you got to say. That's, that's the, that's the story you tell now, you know. I whooped his ass. <laughs> Jay Ryan said, uh, Alan Davis doesn't get a lot of love when these conversations come up. Uh, what does Aaron stand on or what's Aaron stand on Alan Davis? He's one of my favorite comic book artists all time um, really? i love his stuff i would buy stuff that i didn't normally buy just because davis drew it like sure you guys i don't know if you guys remember but was it the late no it had to have been like early 2000s because i think it was a cross gen when it came out but he did a kill raven miniseries for marvel yeah. Oh, okay. yeah and kill raven was in that like 70s zarkov wrestling mm -hmm. outfit you know yep. it hadn't been updated and he did it in that outfit. And I bought that thing because it was Alan Davis. And, um, you know, I bought Excalibur because of him and then Clandestine. Beautiful uh, stuff. Under Clandestine, uh, so underrated. Yeah. Such an underrated book. I actually have the first page from the first issue of Clandestine, the original art, uh, with Modoc on it because I'm a big Modoc fan. And um, I actually had some Silver Surfer pages from that issue, but had to sell them during a period of time of unemployment. Ah. So, um, but yeah, I'm a big, big Davis fan. Big Davis fan. Uh, we got old Dirty Fatty in the house. He had, he does still have the GoFundMe going on right now. If anybody gets a chance, please go check that out. And uh, if you if you can help him out or share it, put it on social media. I'm sure you're very well appreciate, it. brother. I hope you are doing well. Mm -hmm. uh, Mutt had a question. He said, "Where or was there a particular book or run that was your big breakthrough work?" Mm, no, still waiting. <laughs> uh, no, that's not entirely true. Uh, Planet Hulk, but the thing with Planet Hulk was I did half of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Carlo, um, Peglione did half. Well, he did a little more than half and I did a little less than half, but it was pretty much half and half. And, um, I, that was one of those things that I did and everybody goes, Oh, I love Planet Hulk. Did you do right. that? I'm like, well, I did some of it. <laughs> so it was one of those things that, that kind of, it wasn't recognized as my project because i was really carlo was the regular hulk artist and they called mm -hmm. me and said hey he's not going to be able to make the deadlines on this story arc we're doing so would you like you want to do alternating story arcs i'm like yeah of course yeah and so he did the first one where he fought the hulk fought the silver surfer mm -hmm. and then i came in and did the second arc and then he did the third one then i yeah i was like he did four issues i did four issues he did four issues i did two issues he did two issues and then he did one issue. And then I did uh, something else that was like the giant size Hulk that was part of the story, but it was separate from the actual run. So page right. count wise, I think he I did 120 some pages. Wow. He did 140 pages. You know, so he did, basically did a little bit more than the issue more than I did. Um, but so I was kind of like part of the, the group on that. And I had done. I did Excalibur, the second coming of Excalibur with Chris Claremont, but that book didn't really ever get a foothold. So I can't really say that. And then I did Ms. Marvel for two years after Planet Hulk. And I think I got, again, Ms. Marvel was, you know, Ms. Marvel. It was a, 
a medium right. selling book, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> I think Wonder Woman probably got me the the most exposure. Yeah. Um, and that was that's when I went from Marvel to DC, and then I did Wonder Woman. And uh, but I've always even the stuff I've when I got opportunities to work on stuff, I generally would grab stuff that was not like high volume, like Batman or Superman or something like that, because um, I didn't want, thank you, Mike. Um, I didn't want editors messing with me as much. Right. And so if you, if you worked on under the radar projects, no one cared, you do whatever you want. And um, like I did a metamorpho mini series that I wrote and drew. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I pitched metamorpho to Dan to deal was because I knew I mean, I liked all the oddball characters anyway, but I also knew that no one cared editorially, right? And so they're not going to be going, hey, what are you doing with Metamorpho over here? You know, I could pretty much do whatever I wanted. Right. And um, that's kind of how it it came out. And I did a few issues of Batman, but just like as a stopgap, I was supposed to take over Superman after Wonder Woman, but it was that Clark Kent walks across America storyline. And, Mm. you know, it was like, when they told me that's what the story was, I went, I'm not drawing that. And like, that's, yeah, that takes all the fun right out of it. Yeah, yeah, you're like, you're giving me Superman and then you're giving me this. And <laughs> so I said, no. And that's, and then they were like, okay, so they're scrambling to find me something because I was under contract. And that's what I ended up doing uh, with Dan Jurgens. We did uh, Justice League International. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was actually a really good book and was doing really well. Um, you know, not Batman well, but it was, you know, I right. think it, the first issue sold about 70,000 copies. Gosh. And at that time, that was, you know, good numbers. Mm-hmm. And even now they're great numbers. I, I would guess. say they'd be great yeah. numbers today. So Yeah, if they got 40, you got a little bit of a kickback. <laughs> yeah. And then as we, as then as we went along and got down to even, you know, we were 12 issues into it when it got canceled, it was still over 40,000, which made it a top, probably top 10, 15 DC book. But they had... They had Jeff Johns' Justice League, right, with Jim Lee. And I don't think Jeff Johns liked the book. That was my understanding. Not that he didn't like my art or anything, but that he just didn't like that Mm. book. He thought it was goofy and had no business. It was was like bringing down the seriousness of the Justice League he was trying to do. Mm -hmm. And then they had David Finch was supposed to do a Justice League, his own Justice League series, which I don't think he ever did, but I think he ended up doing Batman instead. It was like three issues at best. Oh, was it? Yeah. So they were so they were like, okay, we got too much Justice League going on here, so we're going to cut this book. And the thing is, Dan Jurgens and I both went to Dan DeDio and said, look it, if okay, if it can't be a Justice League book, just change it. It's right. like like a Renegade book, Renegade superheroes, because it didn't it had all the kind of goofy characters like Blue Beetle and Fire and Ice, and mm-hmm. you know from the original uh, Adam Hughes and uh, Kevin McGuire Justice League right stuff and. So, I mean, we didn't even have Captain Adam in there. So, I mean, it's like we just had like the the wretched refuse in there. Yeah. But it was a fun book and it was selling. They were making money on it. So it was like, but yeah, he had, he, he later said the, he probably shouldn't have canceled it. But we're like, yeah. But um, <laughs> so, sight. yeah, so that, that, that's why that got canceled. And then at that point, they were doing the new 52. And the way that that was structured was, that they would they did a launch of was it 52 titles right mm-hmm. something yeah something like that and uh the new 52 i guess that makes sense so they had the 52 titles and then they'd take the lowest selling ones and cancel them after like a year yeah. and then they would bring in whatever it was if it was eight books or six books whatever and then they would bring in six new titles right so they always had 52 the problem was they launched with all their best stuff right yeah and and so I was out of the cycle now because I was launched with the good stuff. Yeah. But then they, they canceled that. So then they were like, well, now we have to, you know, bring Aaron. In. And I think they were at this point we were on their second or third wave of cancellations. And, and so what was left? Oh, I got to do Amethyst, which with Christy Marks, who wrote it, it was a really good book, but nobody cared and nobody read it. You know? <laughs> right. 
So that got canceled after seven issues. So then I was kind of in this weird spiral where I, I couldn't get back up the ladder again because someone was always on the books I wanted to be on and they weren't going to fire them just to accommodate me, right? Why right, would right. they? And so, um, you know, so I had to pick and choose projects as I could. I mean, I would take whatever they gave me, but I would, you know, get special projects like Convergence or, mm -hmm. uh, like I said, I wrote and drew that Metamorpho thing. I did uh, Conan Wonder Woman crossover, which was great fun. Uh, with uh, Gail Simone wrote that. <clears throat> and, um, you know, it would be pro and then the Herculoids when they had the Warner Brothers. But I wanted yeah. to do that stuff. You know, that was my problem. I never really pushed hard to get like, you guys put me on Superman or put me on. I never really pushed for it because I liked doing these oddball characters. They were, to me, were more fun. And so I probably hurt myself, you know, long term with that kind of an attitude. But I had a lot of fun working on projects that, you know, Marvin Martian meets Martian Manhunter. I mean, come on, who doesn't want to do that? Awesome. That actually kind of gets me to one of these next questions is, uh, what did you always want to have a run on? Swamp Thing, Spider-Man, et cetera, um, from Henry. And Henry also said, I like, I did like your run on Sludge, almost a Swamp Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've got Garbage Man now, so that's kind of my true Swamp Thing. Um, and I actually did that for DC at, at first. When I yeah. first went over to DC and I was taught negotiating with Dan DeDio, I was like, you know, I said, I want to, I want to do some writing. I said, I don't want to you know, necessarily become Frank Miller. I said, but if I have a project that I want to write and draw, I want you to at least be willing to take a look at it. And if you like it, we'll do it. If you don't, that's fine, but at least give it a fair shake. And he's like, oh, right. I have no problem with, you know, writer artists. I got no problem with that. And so anyway, and then he said to me in the same but basically the next sentence is like, you know, we need a Swamp Thing character because Vertigo had Swamp Thing mm -hmm, yeah. and uh, they wouldn't give him back to DC and he wanted it in the DCU. Oh, okay. And so he said, we need a monster book. And I said, well, let me see what I can come up with. So I came up with Garbage Man, uh, something I would never have done had not the opportunity been there, you know. So I, so I just came up with that for you know to be a filler for a swamp thing oh, nice. we ended up doing that and before i got even halfway done with it they got swamp thing back from vertigo so <laughs> garbage man was no longer needed but i finished the the mini series type thing that i did with him and then eventually the rights returned to me but for dc it would have been superman i was so excited to get the opportunity to do superman until i found out what the storyline was <laughs> and then i had nothing to do with it That's right so, yeah yeah, so I'm disappointed that I never got to do that. And I, I got to draw Superman in Justice League because I did some Justice League arcs. And that was I, – I, you'd think I would be more of a Batman guy, but I'm really not. I'm, yeah. I never got a handle on Batman. I did a Batman story for um, the uh, online stuff, oh. the digital stuff. And yeah, then it later got yeah. reprinted in Legends of the Dark Knight. And I had a lot of fun working on it, but I always felt like I just – I couldn't get it my head wrapped around Batman for some reason. And, uh, but Superman, I did figure out and really enjoyed working on him and, uh, would have enjoyed that. And then over at Marvel, it would have been <sighs> Captain America. I got a, I had a nice. Captain America story that where he fights the red skull during world war two and red skull had raised up this, all these dead, uh, German soldiers. So they're basically zombie soldiers that uh, Captain America had to fight. And, that would have uh, been awesome. <laughs> but I never got, you never got the opportunity to do that. In fact, one of the reasons I left Marvel was um, I had pitched them, <laughs> I had pitched them a giant size man thing. Woo! And because um, <laughs> I thought it would be funny, right? Everybody knows the giant size man thing joke, right? So I was like, look, if we did this one story, because I had this story where man thing gets abducted by aliens. And they like mess around with his mind and it actually reactivates his brain so he can think like a oh. um, flowers for Algernon type of story where he's really smart for a while. But then it slowly fades and he becomes the dumb shambling Hulk <laughs> again. Yeah. But he has to stay smart enough to save the world from this alien invasion. So um, I had this thing and I pitched it to him and like, yeah, that sounds great. We'll do it. No problem. Yeah, you can draw it. We'll do it. And they just kept putting me off and putting me off and putting me off and putting me off. And uh, then some other things occurred that ticked me off. And so it was the series of things ticking me off. And that's when I went over to DC. So uh, right. I'd love to do that man thing story and do the Captain America story and do a Superman run. And then that would be, that would be my wish list for mainstream comics, but that's never going to happen now. <laughs> Crazy Matt said, do you ever consider landfill over garbage, man? 
Uh, the original title was Wasteland, but that was being used oh. by somebody else. And uh, so then I, I came up with just the most, the simplest, most uh, easy to identify and remember name was just Garbage Man. It seems silly at first, like most names do. But then the more you say it and the more it's out there, you just sort of accept it. And then it becomes, yeah. a thing, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, I was coming up with all these really cool names and I couldn't use any of them because they were already being used. And then, uh, then it just, I said, okay, well, let's just call him garbage, man. That'll be kind of funny. And <laughs> there it is. I love your process that you, uh, when you were starting your YouTube channel, you were going through doing the page layouts, the panels, and then the piece that you had Mickey ink. Like I, I just mm -hmm. adored that to see in your process. It was just beautiful, beautiful work. Thank you. That was, um, yeah, because that was going to be, I was originally trying to do, I, I saw what was going over in, on Comicsgate, you know, and Ethan was having huge success, of course, and a few mm -hmm. other people were. And um, I thought, well, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to go full blown because I was still working in the industry and I knew there'd be some backlash. Yeah. So I knew, um, uh, and, and so, of course, I didn't think it was going to be as bad as it ended up being when I actually did do it. But crazy. Um, now I don't care. But at the, at the time I did, because I thought I had mm -hmm. a lot of friends that apparently I didn't have. Um, but isn't it funny so, how that works out? Yeah, isn't that funny? Um, but so I tried to launch the Garbage Man and uh, through, um, through, you know, like an Indiegogo campaign. Yeah. And I was like... Uh, I didn't really understand the concept of crowdfunding and it's mm -hmm. like you do anything. And I actually talked to Dan Burnt and cause he does a lot of stuff on Kickstarter. And he was like, cause I would say, well, if you're selling original art on your campaign, you're not really selling the book. So you're making money, but you're not really making the money doing the book. If you can't make the money just doing the book, then why are you doing it? You know, yeah, right. It's just, you know, it's stupid. And he finally was like, Aaron, the idea is you raise enough money to publish your book no matter what it takes, whatever you have to sell to raise that money to publish the book. And I'm like, yeah, I guess that does make sense, doesn't it? <laughs> so, so I, uh, you know, I kind of learned from my failure doing the, the first Indiegogo Garbage Man and, uh, um, you know, kind of learned the ways of crowdfunding through that failure. But I was able to take it to Dark Horse and uh, because it was already done, all I had to do was remove Batman from it. Mm -hmm. And um, mm. I think when I was doing the, this, probably when I was doing the Kickstarter before I went to Dark Horse, um, I think I got Danny to ink the pinup. Mm -hmm. I was going to pay him to do it. And he's like, no, no, I'll do it. And I'm like, dude, you do, I'll, I'll nice. pay you to do it. And he's like, no, I'll do it, man. And of course, that piece is unbelievably good. And uh, so that ended up just being a pinup. I think it was, it was going to be a limited edition print or something. I can't remember. But I ended up just being a pinup in the Dark Horse edition. And, um, but yeah, he's, uh, I always tried to work with Danny, but he was always, always working on Batman or working on, you know, something that J.R. Jr. was doing or that Joe Casada was doing. And it was like, yeah. he's so good. So, yeah. Yeah. It was he, like, a, he had no, he had no time. I mean, he inked part of Planet Hulk cause I talked him into it and then he finally had to bail cause he just couldn't keep up. And, uh, so, and then I would get like an X-Men backup story and I'd go. Come on, Danny. It's only eight pages. You can do it, you know. And, <laughs> and he would come in and do it. And uh, so I have a few things that he worked on that were, you know, but smaller projects because I could never get him for a uh, an entire run on something. Uh, Wiley J draws, and Chris actually had similar questions of who your favorite artists were. Um, Wiley J was specifically of the non CG because we probably already talked about that throughout. Just. We know who, who are awesome here at CG, but who are your uh, favorite artists? Who inspire you or inspired? Well, uh, it's even to this day, man, if I'm feeling like I just I don't have it, I will go look at Frazetta or I'll go look at Wrightson and then then I'll get it back pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, uh, guys, I but it's changed over the years. Right. So if you go if you go, who are the guys that really formed my comic book language? It was Wrightson. It was Neil Adams. And it was Frazetta. And um, then I would then, you know, I had a period where I really loved Jim Starlin stuff like on Warlock and Captain yeah. Marvel in the 70s. And um, I always was a big John Severn fan, mainly because Severn was drawing King Cole, which was always my favorite barbarian okay. comic. Um, <clears throat> he only did 10 issues, but they were they're great. 
And uh, then I had Barry, I had a Barry Smith phase, you know, where I kind of oh, discovered of Conan retroactively. Shane, do I inspire you, Aaron? Hill? Oh, because... It comes to you, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> Hail, mortal me. But um, so, though, you know, and then, of course, I bought How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way when it first came out. And, uh, you know, they is that the like, hardcover edition, the first yeah. printing of it? Okay, oh, cool. Oh, the hardcover yeah. one. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so John Buscema, I love John Buscema's stuff I did growing up. I still love it. Um, so I went through stages, but the guys in that period of time were always, uh, that I always went back to were Wrightson, Frazetta, and Neil Adams. And then in the 80s and the 90s, as I was, you know, I was in college at that point and then trying to break in, you know, I, Dale Keown's Hulk was, you know, I didn't even read the Hulk because the Hulk, I could never get into him because he was so dumb, you yeah. know, but when, when, uh, when Dale started drawing, I was like, this is awesome, you know, so that I started reading the Hulk regularly. Um, that, like I said before, Alan Davis, um, was never a huge Frank Miller fan, although I didn't. I, his storytelling was always really, really cool. Yeah. Uh, Simonson too. I love yeah. Simonson's storytelling. That, that, those are guys you can actually look at and learn something from. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And um, so, a big Simonson fan, and he's a he's a friend of mine. So he, I, I'm a big fan of him as a person and as an artist. Um, I liked. Uh, I got to know Mike Plug several years ago and he did a book a santa claus book i don't know if you guys have seen it the life and adventures so. of santa claus it was so. tundra published it as a hardcover uh that was uh eastman's publishing brand there for a while oh, okay. he they went under but uh you look at look it up on ebay if you're into if you like fantasy stuff if you don't it probably wouldn't be your cup of tea but if you like elves and that kind of stuff mm-hmm. it's awesome What's and it called? It just, uh the life and adventures of santa claus um by mike plug and that that that's something i look at just to get inspiration from um you know i don't like jim lee's stuff but i was you know i never like chased him around kind of thing Mm -hmm. but i like his stuff um arthur adams of course you know um i i never Hmm. i never got mcfarland as an illustrator but i loved his storytelling techniques and how he'd break down pages and his design work and stuff i thought was really cool right um, yeah. and so you know and i look at i i've always say there's certain names but there's if anybody's doing good work i'll look at it because i figure there's something i can get from it mm-hmm. you know and uh but i don't <clears throat> i don't really chase artists uh, lee weeks i like a lot um i michael golden stuff um those are kind of overstating the obvious because they're every, everybody likes those guys but um that's you know i'm just off the top of my head you know those are probably the names the guys that you know there's that there's a there's a, a few guys that if they do a comic i'll buy it i don't care what the comic is and i've always been like that even as a kid mm-hmm. you know i would i would chase artists um, Same those here. are the guys, the main guys. John, you know, I, I like Burns stuff, like his stuff on Captain America. I never read the X-Men. I was never an X-Men guy, but um, <clears throat> I, I always thought that Burn. there was a great quote in a, <clears throat> excuse me, he was, uh, I think I read this in a fanzine or something, that during the 80s, he was at a convention. And someone had, you know, it said, I don't know, he, he made the comment that, yeah, I don't know why everybody loves my stuff. It was probably false modesty knowing him, but uh, he was like, I don't know why everybody loves my stuff, you know. It's and but someone made the comment, they said it's because you draw comics the way we all expect them to look. There and you I thought go. That's a great description of Burns stuff. Yeah. It's like the model sheet. Yeah, you just you like it, it looks it, you know, you're never disappointed with Burn. He never does anything that would just like blow your mind in terms of illustrative quality, but as a comic book artist, he delivers the goods all the time. And it's it's really well done, and you know it's really friendly. You really like it. You don't have right. to, you know. It's not one of those styles that you have to grow accustomed to. Or I didn't get this at first, but after a while, I kind of enjoyed it. It's like the minute you see it, you go, "Yeah, that's what the stuff should look like." So, I mean, I liked him. I liked him from that standpoint. I always like burn stuff, but everybody likes burn. You know, that's no. Uh, 
that's not a stretch. Right. Yeah, for sure. Mike Zach, um, you know. Oh yeah, phenomenal show. Guys, I'm not gonna be able to get to all your questions because I do want to take a look at Wraith of God and talk about that for a second. But Chris does have an interesting question here. What was it like for the for Aaron to work on his first comic and see it printed? I was um it was crazy because you have you know when you're trying to break in or you're trying to achieve a goal and you're young, <clears throat> everything feels like a fantasy. Like you're you're you know, you have imagine how it's gonna go, right? And and you think if only I can do that, I'll be the happiest person in the world. And so you you create this whole that's why we have rose colored glasses and look at our past, right? As being so wonderful True. when it really wasn't. <laughs> but right. you had those you had those feelings of you know excitement and so i get this i get the the job from spider-man i'm doing backflips right i mean i did a like a short spider-man story marvel comics presents 39 totally sucks but <laughs> i got this story and i did it and i'm sitting there going i'm on my drafting table drawing spider-man living at home with my parents right and um roommates yeah my roommates <laughs> the and, roommates yeah. um, <clears throat> thinking thinking my gosh this is it and uh, and it wasn't it, you know, and so you get this sort of depressed thing, but then you get this will to fight and you're like, I'm going to go back and I'm going to make it. I can make it. I can do it. And um, when I was uh, when I first went into the Marvel offices, it was like I was like a kid. You know, you get the little Marvel sticker, your name tag has Spider-Man on it and you're walking around. You're going, I'm here. I'm walking around the Marvel offices. I got your portfolio under your arm and you're like, this is something you dreamt about your whole life. Right. As a kid, right. And, um, I remember listen, I was, they had a bunch of, they had a bunch of drafting tables pushed together in the center of this office. The op, all the office was around the outside of the building. And so in the middle, they had this, you know, this couches to hang out on and did some drafting tables. And I was sitting there working on a what the page, right? Because I had to right. change something on the Silver Surfer. I can't remember what it was. And <clears throat> I'm sitting there working on it, right? Tom Rainey comes down and sits, you know, kind of back to back to me, but just a little bit over Kitty Corner. But he, we were back to back. And I didn't know Tom and he didn't know me at the time. And he's over there working on an X-Men double page spread. And I'm working <laughs> on this stupid what the page, you know. And <laughs> Editors would walk by and assistant editors would walk by and, these people, and they would look at what I was doing because there was like this little pathway between the drafting tables and they would look at what I was doing and say nothing. And then they go over to Tom Rainey and look over his shoulder and go, oh, dude, that's so cool. And I had to listen to this all freaking day, <laughs> for at least two hours or whatever. I was there working on this thing and he yeah. was working on this double page X-Men spread. Everybody telling him how great he was and no one said anything to me. They would look over my shoulder and then keep walking. And I was just like, man. Oh, man. That's one of those uh, reality. I know shows. the vibes when people yeah. bring up Reaper yeah. Destroyer. I'm like, don't forget about Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Mike said, uh, "Art is hell, part two: The Revenge of Aaron Lopresti." Revenge Lepresti. of Aaron Lepresti. I like That's it. Right. <laughs> but it was that chip on my shoulder that right. motivated me, you know, to mm -hmm. keep me going. And I would be, you know, I spent half my career pissed off about something, and I was like, "I'm going to show you guys." And uh, so that kept me motivated, kept me to, to get better. Uh, to a point where I, you know, was doing work that I was actually happy with and, and people, you know, will compliment you on as opposed to just look at and go, yeah, and keep, <laughs> keep walking. But <clears throat> yeah, to answer his question, I mean, I made a, a, a short story long, but it was exciting. Really? It was just like it was a dream come true for a little kid. You feel like a little mm -hmm. kid for a few minutes. And then after you're in the industry for 30 years, you just become a cynical grouch. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. Well, now you're kicking ass with uh, Wraith of God Blood Hunters. And I see some person dropped a link in there. Thank you very much. We also have the link below, guys. But definitely, Thank if you haven't yet, go person. check this out. Uh, this book looks great. And I've seen some of the stuff you you posted on, uh, I don't know if it's Facebook or Twitter. Maybe everywhere, maybe everywhere probably. Yeah. But just some of the line art as you're drawing it. And I, I just really, I do see some like uh, some rights in coming through with some of the the rendering and stuff mm -hmm. you know like it's, it's really really awesome and i gotta give a shout out to kayla who is a uh, co-host on our other show appreciating comic book art tuesday at tens tuesdays at 10. 10 um i'm sure she won't mind me saying this but kayla said that out of all the books that she's read yours is the best written and like she just loves the way you write 
Right. So, and that's high praise because I mean, she's she's very she is, she's she very is. stingy Does on the she whole have stuff, but, <laughs> which I mean, what is high praise? And she, yeah. you know, definitely she she points this book out to be one of the better written books uh, that she's written or read. Um, you know, and like I said earlier, a lot of that comes from, thank you, Phil, I appreciate that. Um, that comes from my experiences at film school where my focus was on two things, writing and directing. And I think I did a lot more writing than I ever did directing. And, uh, you know, when you start looking at things as a screenplay and, you know, story structure for, and, and everything I write is, um, is finite. I don't write like episodic TV. I write like mm. a movie, right? And it's got right. a, your beginning, middle and end and your payoff at the end. And so um, I spent a lot of time learning that type of stuff. I just never, I was so focused on my art during my comic career. I didn't really push to write stuff that often. Uh, even though growing up as a kid, that's all I did was write and then illustrate the stories. Uh, right, so it was always, yeah. it's always something I really enjoyed doing um, rather than just drawing. But um it's nice because you never know. You write something and you think, I think this is good, but it maybe it sucks. And right. so, yeah. you know, I, it got a lot of positive response, obviously. And I, I'm very grateful for that because you never know, man. You never know. So and then, cool. then you've got the added pressure. Boy, okay, everybody liked the first one. I better come through on the second one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right well, I mean, the character design is, is cool in general. Like, it, for me, you know, I love how comic book art comes first for me the story is great you know but like i'm i'm completely honest like i get drawn to stuff by the quality of the art and i can be completely so happy just flipping through a book and never reading it you know yeah so art way. character design are huge you know so when you get a character like this um you, you know what this reminds me of aaron and, and maybe you remember this not a lot of people do when i bring this up but there was a show like in the 80s the 1980s it was called the scarecrow yeah, and it was like show yeah, yeah, the, he it was like kind of like a western or whatever, and he was like a superhero scare. Yeah, mm -hmm. I remember that growing up. And uh, this look wise, when I first saw this character, it reminded me of that. Even though it's not a scarecrow aesthetic, it's more of you know this kind of like a cowboy wraith kind of thing. But it just it reminded me of that and and feel like it just kind of shot me to my childhood for a second. But uh, the character design is fantastic. Well, thank you. the The interesting thing about this character is. It's a very simple design. What it originally was, was a Western ghostwriter pitch to Marvel. Oh, and okay. I, so I, I did this in the 90s and uh, tried to get it to Marvel. Now, I wasn't a big enough name at that point. I was barely a name at all. Gotcha. And then to try and pitch them a Western, it was like, but I, mm. again, it was the philosophy. Oh, it's just kind of this backward character that no one cares about. Maybe they'll throw me a bone and let me do it. And, right. uh, but they, they didn't. And, but I really liked the story and I was like, okay, well, can I change this somehow and make it my own thing? And so I thought, well, um, even though he's a, uh, questionable Christian character, uh, certainly a God fearing character, whether or not he's a Christian or not is, you know, right. very ambiguous. What is in his mind and what reality is maybe two different things. But so, making him a, a in black didn't make a lot of sense, but at the same time, I didn't have any options because I couldn't make him white because he was already yep. the ghostwriter, right? That was, yeah. So I said, well, I'll just make the guy black. I'll change his hat to kind of a Clint Eastwood hat, right? Rather than a, just a regular cowboy hat. Yeah. And then tatter him up so he looks scary and then uh, make him a monster hunter, which I think actually was my original plan anyway to do with Ghost Rider because it was like, Ghost Rider going around shooting up bad guys who held up banks was kind of bleh, no one cares about that. But if he was hunting right. monsters, they might, you know, it might be interesting. And uh, so, like I said, Marvel, you know, I couldn't get anywhere with Marvel with it. So I just said, well, I'm saving this. And and that's how it came about. So uh, it was it was really just a matter of realizing I couldn't make him this white glowing figure. I had to make him black <laughs> or, or marvel would probably sue me so uh, well, yeah. good, good point but you know black is just a it's a it's cool color you know it looks good in print you know it looks good in color it looks good in it looks print cool. it looks cool yeah you know? and someone who's a monster hunter yeah it makes sense i mean it makes sense from a lot of um uh, standpoint so but yeah this is something i developed in the 90s and just been sitting on forever i funny thing is i almost had this sold to dan to and dc 
just before Dan really? got let go. I mean, we were really wow. close. And um, then it just didn't happen. So I guess that's divine intervention there. Um, but uh, but I'm that's not, I, I mean, I like Westerns. I'm not, I'm not someone who loves Westerns. I mean, I, I have greater appreciation for them now than I did when I was a kid. Um, but, you know, it's not necessarily a genre that I would just go, oh, I got to do a Western. It just happened to be that this was a pitch for uh, a ghostwriter, you know, Western ghostwriter. And um, right. so, because, you know, we all know drawing horses is a pain in the butt. Yeah, yeah I've never attempted it because I, <laughs> I Mine have looks never like donkeys. used to. Yeah. Maybe one day I'll have to draw one, but right now I'm just like, yeah, that, that looks difficult. <laughs> yeah. Well, the interesting thing about this project is it's a hundred pages. So there's a 53 page Wraith story in it. Right. And that's, I'm just finished. I've got two pages to go and I'm done with nice. that. And then there's these backup stories, which is yeah. the nightclub here, this giant elephant guy. Um, and this was something I had also come up with in the nineties was originally called creeps, but then somebody, had used that title before I could get to it. So I changed it to the nightclub and now Mark Millar's using that, but yeah. <laughs> I'm still using it anyway, because there's some disagreement about who came up with it first. So gotcha. I'm going to go with it. And then, um, and then the gar of course, keeping garbage man alive with a new garbage man story in here. And then uh, the last one is the Kit Carter, which is the space babe with a bubble helmet um, so that cool. I've been kind of doing like just side strips for 20 years and just never done anything with so nice um so what yeah a great so time really... to live into to have your 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 characters put them all together it's just like wow like just bring them to life it, it's it, it's a lot of fun because um i've had a lot of ideas i've always developed ideas throughout my career i just you know marvel and dc were, are very reluctant to use new concepts because mm -hmm. Spider-Man sells, Batman sells, this thing isn't going to sell, so we're not going to do it. And right. so you've got these ideas just sitting there, and majority of them are fully developed and ready to go. And I've been trying to figure out what's the best way to present this stuff in an independent market. And because um, you don't want to neglect the Wraith because you've got success there, so you don't want to just toss that aside and do something else. So what I, what I think I'm going to do going forward is – uh, do I have a Wraith lead story and then I'll have backup, a couple backup features in every issue featuring some of the other characters I want to do. And then if a bunch of people say, Hey, oh, we really like that one, then you know, spin it off and, and do its own thing, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it's a good idea. So, and that's kind of what I happened here. I making a hundred page Ooh. book was dumb because it's just it's so much work. I was gonna say it's uh, huge, that is huge, yeah. Yeah, so you know, the next they're all I'm gonna be doing 64 page books with say like a going forward, like a you know, maybe a 35 page wraith story and then a couple of you know, 10 page backups or something just to kind of get those other IPs out there, you know. Uh, crazy man, so you can do white as an uh angelic inverse to wraith maybe in the future issues. You know, what's funny about that is I've had a similar concept with Reaper Destroyer mm -hmm. at some point down the line of having having those switch from black to white for a storyline and going back to you can do so much though with characters like this that's why i like these kind of like anti-hero darker characters mm -hmm. i guess you could say there's so much you can do with them you know and then they emerge and they become gray yeah they're <laughs> well in some degrees they're they're morally ambiguous right mm -hmm. and so you you can go a lot of different directions with them and still sort of be within character because if they're if there's someone like the wraith he thinks he knows who he is, but we've seen the origin or part of the origin. Anyway, not all the story, but some of the story. And you kind of get the idea that, wait a minute, is this guy, is this, is this legit or is he nuts? You know? And so that's always kind of in the background, something you can play with. And, uh, um, and then of course the dynamic with Esther, who's basically is Alfred, uh, that, you know, she is a very, you know, serious, dedicated Christian woman. And she's trying to deal with this guy who, invokes the power of god or at least says he does but right. doesn't always act like it so she's not really sure what she's got herself into right you know so there's all these sort of That's interesting good dynamic, things yeah. you can play with um so but yeah i had when i was i had no idea which ip to use because i had so many of them and uh 
I basically drew straws and uh, Wraith of God won. And so I figured, okay, so I'm going to do. And just thankful that it's it's worked out so far. No, yeah, it's it's, it's a good show. That's badass. I don't like that. What uh, <clears throat> what do you use for inking? I meant to ask you that earlier or uh, to go over like some tools a little bit, but what do, what do you primarily do for your inking? Well, uh, my entire life, I've been a brush inker my entire life. Okay. You know, I'd hear these guys that use the quill pens and they'd say, mm -hmm. use a one Oh two, use a one Oh two. And I found it so stiff and inflexible mm. that it just annoyed me. I did ink the legends of the dark Knight story. I did. I inked that with a crow quill just to do it. Um, but I didn't, um, I didn't like it. And then it may just be because I haven't spent as much time with the pen to really get a, a firm grip on making it do the things I want it to do. Um, <clears throat> but with Wraith of God, I really wanted it to feel like this dirty spaghetti Western, right? And so I'm mm -hmm. kind of like, I'm not going to do brush work and have it real slick. Okay. Right? So I went in with, uh, basically I'm using Microns. Okay. And, um, uh, some Copic and, um, this, that piece right there, I may have done with a brush. Okay. Except for that cross hatching. That's a pen like in right. his knee and his leg, that cross yep. hat, that, that's all uh micron. And, um, Interesting. so, but it's great because during COVID before I launched this, I was doing a lot of, uh, what I called Aaron cons, right? I do these weekend shows where I would just stream for eight hours and just like I was at a convention and I would be doing, taking sketch requests. And I got so comfortable working with these pens, doing these marker sketches mm -hmm. that I thought, well, what if I incorporated that sort of looseness and roughness into Wraith of God and yeah. that would give me that sort of gritty, I hate to use that term because what does that mean? But that sort of, that, that looser, grittier, uh, spaghetti Western kind of dirty kind of feel that I wanted this book to have. And so that's what I've been doing um, is using a pen for the most part. Uh, the garbage man stuff was more brush of the okay. pages I've done so far, but um, I've got those, I've got the pens down that I can make them do what I want them to do um, line work wise. So that, it looks a lot like a, a brush anyway. So if I want it to, so that's kind of the direction I'm going now is using these pens. Um, but I do, I do use brush here and there for certain things that if I want it to look a certain way, I primarily been using um, pens, but I've been trying to break out and try new things. I've been trying to get better at doing the, the, the crow quill. Uh, I've tried to do a little bit of brush work. I'm, I'm just more comfortable with pens and just trying to manipulate the line work to make it look, you know, I guess a little bit more traditional, but I did notice with pen work because you can get s the pens that are like just so small, like you can get the, just mm -hmm. the fine little lines. Mm -hmm. If you want to do some gradation or some really mm -hmm. fine cross hatching that I haven't been able to do with any other equipment. So I, I think it's, it's, I guess right now I'm kind of at a point where I'm, I'm experimenting more than anything, primarily do pens, but I'll also branch out, if I think I can do something here with a brush or do something right. here with, with a crow quill, you know? Well, the brush, the thing with the brush is it, it requires such focus and concentration <laughs> because if you get, if you let up just a little bit, what's this? I'm glad Ray's hat isn't super dumb looking like gunslinger spawn. <laughs> <laughs> There's another similar book, but, um, uh, with the brush, it's like it, your your concentration level has to be so high all the time to control yeah. that line. And I get bored and then start getting sloppy. So, I mean, I can ink a cover with a brush and it'll come out pretty well. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing interior pages, it's not long before I'm just like, duh, 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 you know, because you just I just want to be done with it. I'm yes. bored. Yeah. And um, what I found with the pens is we're all used to penciling. Like I've been, a, you know, I've always inked my stuff when I had the opportunity, but I mean, I, my, my ink, professional ink work is probably, um, pencil to ink is probably 80 to 20% if you look at my, you know, my pro career, right? And so you, most of the stuff we do is penciling. Right. So you start using a micron and it acts a lot like an ink pencil. So you can still, you're still in that comfort zone of doing what 
you're used to doing most of the time. And as long as you know, oh, I got to beef up this line here, or I got to grade eight this line here. Yeah, you have to go over it a couple times with a, a micron that you wouldn't necessarily have to do with a brush because you can just control it with the pressure. Um, but you can still get the look you want. And it's flexible enough that you can do something rougher like I'm doing on R Wraith of God because that's yeah. what I want texture wise. Um, and the microns are allegedly archival ink, so they shouldn't fade. And that's the thing back like, in the early 90s or in the 80s when i was doing commercial art and stuff we had these niji stylists i don't know if you guys ever saw those uh -oh. and they came in they were brown and they came in black but we used to use them to do storyboards and we do that we do them on marker bond paper we do the storyboards on marker bond paper like for nike ads or whatever right and we would do this but these niji stylists they fade and we had this here's a horror story for you and our studio, our studio source, we had in the 90s for two years. And in Portland, we had this big art board, three sections of it, uh, screwed to the wall. And whenever artists would come into town for a comic book show, we'd have a big party at our studio and we'd have them draw on this board, right? So. <laughs> Malin jumping in here says, screw your fancy brushes, pens, and tooth." Toothy papers. I'm going back to cave paintings for my project. Yeah. I like that. He's Mr. Digital. You, now. you can pull it off. You can pull it yeah. off. Hey, John Malin, man, he's he's entered the new age, man. He is, uh, yeah. But Mike Mignola did this gigantic Hellboy that was probably three feet tall. Uh yeah, it was probably three feet tall uh, on this board. And but he did it with his, one of these brown Niji stylists, right? Interesting. Now I was never gonna sell this because it would have been uncool to do something like that where these people come in and like, you know, Arthur Adams drew on it. Kevin Nolan drew on it. Dan Jurgens drew on it. Uh, Ron friends. We had all these different guys that had come through town and drawn on this board. And um, so I still have it in my garage wrapped in plastic and I was going to sell it and just wow. then take the money and give it to a charity or something. Right. But because Mignola, the crown piece on this, he did with a Niji stylist. It's, freaking disappeared oh like, no you can't even hardly see it and it's oh. so disappointing because you know how much money something like you know a three-foot hellboy right would, yeah. you know and wow. um so yeah so it, it's so it, there it sits in my garage so i don't even know what to do with it anymore because it's just it's really sad though but that's what those pens used to do that you you they would discolor or they would just disappear you know Jeez. sharpies would turn purple Mm -hmm. And now they don't anymore. They fixed those. Yeah. Um, they stay black, but, and don't fade, but they used to. And so I would never use markers to ink with. Uh, but now that they've got this stuff that with the archival ink in it, it's like, heck yeah, it's easier. So why not? There's a piece that John Byrne did for Secret Wars. And I think our Adams did some inking on it. And like the pen, the marker he used, like mm -hmm. it's just fading away. And it's just like, mm -hmm. oh shit. Like, all that yep. beautiful art is going away. It's funny because Gary Martin, um, he was, um, somebody got in touch with them <laughs> about a, it was a golden page that John Beatty had inked from the NAM, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's like, if I hold a match underneath it, maybe it'll magically reappear. <laughs> um, but uh, part of it, Beatty had inked with one of these crappy markers, right? And so it was it was turning brown and disappearing. And so you had part of the page was inked with traditional ink. And then the other part was with this other ink. So this guy hired Gary to go in and touch it up. So he had to go pull the pages out and all that stuff and look at Beatty's style and look at, I don't know why they didn't go to Beatty. Maybe Beatty, you know, wouldn't have done it. But um so Gary, and he did a great job. It looks exactly like Beatty inking golden. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference. But this guy had bought this original art and it was disappearing. So he had Gary go in and, you know, restore it basically. Nice. So, yeah, there was a lot of that stuff. We're using pens and not even thinking, oh, 20 years from now, this is going to fade sure. to nothing, you know? Yeah. So. Hopefully no, we won't be saying that 20 years from now. Going, I was just oh, going to say, yeah, that, that just popped in my head like, oh, yeah. Yeah, because oh. most stuff I do is is all pen work right now, or pencils if somebody else is inking it. But right, um, yeah, I was just I was just interested because I've seen a lot of the new 
new art or new pages you posted and i really like the uh the, the grittiness like you talked yeah. about that there's coming through in that style and i was wondering i was like well what does he use to ink but yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All I could use to get that look because I am seriously on some of the cross hatching. I'm just doing this. I'm going like this, and then just to make it as loose and junky as I possibly can to get that feel. And you couldn't do that with a you know with a traditional brush or pen. You can only do that with a, a pencil or a marker that acts like a pencil. Right. Um, well, you know, some of the, like that the hatching and stuff. It reminds me a lot of like you know, like Sylvester is doing right now, which is yeah, kind of his version of like a, of rights and kind of stuff, but it's, mm -hmm. it's very sketchy. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at his line work, I mean, the, the figure work is great, but like, if you look at a lot of the cross hatching or just the gradation and stuff, it's very, very loose, very sketchy. You know, lines are kind of sloppy in the, in the, not in a bad way. Right. But just sloppy in a great way. It just, mm -hmm. it looks, it looks beautiful. Like that, that's right. what he's doing with the style. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of that. Well, that's kind of the he was one of the original guys I looked at and kind of got the inspiration to get looser because I saw I thought this stuff looks really cool. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Because sketches always look better than finished art because finished art always True. ends up getting polished and then that, you kind of ink the life out of it sometimes. So I was a really digging what Sylvester was doing. And then I looked at, you know, Ron Garney's gotten loose, Lee Weeks kind of gets loose. And it's like all that stuff has such energy to it. And I was like, I got to get some of that. Yeah, Gil Kane, same problem. He inked a bunch of that stuff. Pens. Pens. First of all, it looks like crap, but then it's like tearing <laughs> as well, you know. So <laughs> that's horrible. Yeah, but me and Joe got to see some Gil Kane layouts. Uh, Joe came oh, to visit me right. in, in November, and my my buddy owns a couple yep. comic shops. So we went down to the beach, hung out, and he's like, "You guys want to see some Gil Kane original art?" We're like, "Yeah, don't threaten me with a good time." Yeah, I forgot which book it was, but it was oh it was so cool just to see. His, his gesture drawing and his breakdowns, his fundamentals, and then it was inked on like like rice paper. Yeah, it was really it was it was yeah. interesting. Yeah, it we was did. very cool to see. It was very cool to see. But yeah. I think one of them was Conan, wasn't it? It was it was a I it could have been Conan, like a, but it was a Conan Culver oh, type yeah, of character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. But no, like it's it's interesting. Like I've I've kind of took inspiration from Sylvester a little bit as well, just adding in a little bit more of that kind of gritty looseness into the art, mm -hmm. because you're right. There's something about sketches do for some reason look better sometimes than the actual yeah. finished art, because I think you, you can be over polished, even though it looks great. Mm -hmm. Some of the energy and dynamics can be, you know, yep. sucked out of it in that yep. process, but that sketchiness, that raw feel, it energy just, it just stays. And mm -hmm. Sylvester is killing it right now with that Batman book. Yeah. I love what you're doing with Wraith of God. You know, there's you know Thank a few you. other artists out there that are doing it as well. So like I yeah, I definitely been gravitating to that more lately in in kind of my own stuff and things that are inspiring me as of late. Well, somebody I think it was Hillary Barta told me one time. You know, because I would get so focused on inking. You know, you're like, oh, this hand has to be perfect. And he's like, dude, look at the whole page. Don't look at one section of one mm. panel. Right. You know, and so getting the ability to kind of back off a little bit from that and just kind of say, what, what am I going for overall here? You know, instead of worrying about, is there, is that fingernail perfect? Right. You know what I mean? And it's like, I used to do stuff like that. And it's like, it's insanity. It's, it, you, you want the overall thing to work together. And, and if you just ink the life out of it, it may look pretty, like you said, from a polished stand professional standpoint, mm -hmm. but the energy and stuff that you need for the story isn't there. Mm -hmm. And so it, it took me a long time to kind of get to this stage where I could loosen up and have some fun with it. And that's kind of what I'm doing with Wraith of God. Now I don't know when I start, I got to do the nightclub story, although I'm not inking the nightclub story. That's what that giant elephant guy right. we looked at. <clears throat> I have a, I have a mainstream anchor doing that and he's really, really good. Nice. So it's going to look much cleaner and polished than what I do. But I even tell him, I was like, hey, rough those holding lines a little bit more, you know, give it a little bit more energy. Um, and he's done a great job. But, um, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be able to go back to doing like super slick stuff that I used to do when right. I was working with a brush. It's just this is more liberating and fun and it has more energy. And I just, you know. That's a great way to put it. Like, I feel the same thing, too. It just, yeah, it's a little bit more freedom, I think. And just what you can do. And that's great advice too. Like when you're, you know, for drawing, just 
I have the tendency as well. I'm sure a lot of artists do to just focus too much on like a small thing within the page that you think yeah. everybody's going to notice because you know, right. you're the artist, you're drawing it, you notice it. Mm-hmm. And then a lot of times when you show people, like they just look at the, like, yeah, they spend like, a comic, minute less. Yeah. They, they spend just look at everything as a whole. Page. Like, right. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, it's good advice. It's good advice to kind of get out of your head sometimes. And, as uh, long just, as your you know, drawing is good. Right. You can do a rougher ink job and it's still going to hold up because the structure is there. The drawing is there, right? Mm-hmm. you know? So that's kind of what I have to keep reminding myself. Cause I like guys that are minimalists, you know, that just draw really well, but don't do any of the line work and stuff. But yeah. I, I have a hard time doing that because when I, I do that, I always feel like, Oh, I need to shade this. I need some line work. in right. here. Yeah, Cause that's yep. just, that's how I've trained myself, but I can see how other people do it much simpler and it looks really great, but it's really hard for me to do that. And, and then I found, like I said, that having these controlled, perfect feather lines in and of themselves are really cool. You can say, Oh, look at those feather lines I did, but what is it doing to the overall picture? Is it, is it making it more static? Is it, you know, is it flattening it out when you want it to be more three dimensional and, you know, because it's so perfect, you know, it's like a really super smooth statue, you know, it's like, yeah, I, I, you can see it, but it's sometimes it's so hard to make yourself do it when you're used to having this refined look for your whole career. Right. Sure. No, I'm so glad you said I definitely connect with that 100%. Um, guys, we've been going for just a little over two hours. Uh, we're going to let Aaron get out of here and, and do what he's got to do. But we are uh, super, super excited grateful. that you jumped on with us. Yeah, super grateful. This was an awesome conversation. We love getting into the nitty gritty of art talking some tools, talking some technique. And that is what we absolutely love. So thank you so much for your time, Aaron. Well, thank you guys for inviting me and having me on. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk randomly and not have to run the control board. Yeah, that's always nice sometimes. (laughs) You got an open invite whenever you want to hop back on. It was was a pleasure to, to talk to you. Thank and you, every, everybody, it. if you haven't yet, please go uh, check out Wraith the God. I have a link down below. It's been dropped in the chat multiple times, but check it out. Back it looks great. Um, remember, this Saturday we are launching the supplemental book on the Reaper Destroyer campaign <laughs> Saturday at noon. Um, Sean will be hopefully showing off some new stuff from Type 1 as well. But mm-hmm. uh, here's a quick preview of the cover I've been working on for the, the yes. supplemental book. That's with cool. uh, Thank you. Thank you. I got uh, two brand new backup stories with art by Fabio Fabio Samo and Oliver Isabedra with a story written by Kayla, our very own Kayla. Oh, shit, we got a super chat. Hold on a second. Sheldon, I got to give you the, uh, let's do the uh, Dr. Fishy treatment. Dr. Fishy! No! You see that? <laughs> it says thanks guys fun stream thank you brother for the 499 i appreciate from? you that dr fishy what is that it's there's an old skit or i don't know how old it is i i think i saw it like 10 years ago but there's a old skit called uh bad man yeah and it's this dude that just does these little skits as the like the uh, christian bale kind of batman voice mm-hmm. and he's got like five of them or something out there there's a bunch there's one with superman in there and yeah. then it's like it's like they're hilarious. Oh, though. it's brilliant. It's, it's they're brilliant. like 15 minute long, just little featurettes, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's just they're all funny, they're all comical. And are uh, these on I, YouTube or are they are yeah, look it up, just look up YouTube. uh bad yeah. man. Yeah. Just bad B-A- man. Yeah, yeah, bad man, B-A-D-M-A-N. Okay. And uh, it should pop right up. And uh it, they, yeah, it's it's worth <laughs> a watch, man. Because it <laughs> you'll check it out, you'll get laughing at it for sure. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, Saturday, guys, May 13th, noon, check in on this channel. We're going to be streaming for a little while, having some fun, dropping the supplemental on the campaign. Everybody go check out and sign up for Type 1, which is Sean's book. Hopefully, we'll have some new pages this Saturday as well that we can show off. But there's yeah. links for all this stuff below, guys. If you want to know why the world didn't end according to the Mayans in December of 2012, well, I have the answers for you in the issue of Type 1. So take the shot, sign up, spread it. It's an action adventure uh, throwback to 80s, 90s comics and cartoons with uh, shiny stuff in there and the kick-ass action. <laughs> love it. Love right. it. Uh, I love the Batman doesn't kill people. Yeah, that's what this one is from. That that skit right there, Micra. That's, that clip is from the Batman doesn't kill people. So, yeah, Aaron, you get a chance to check I it know, out. Gonna, I got to check that out. Now. Yeah, you won't regret it. It's hilarious. Uh, all right, guys, we will be side Saturday. We will be back here Tuesday for appreciating comic book art live at 10 o'clock. 
Tuesday, sorry, at 10, we're going to be looking at Sylvester's last issue of the deadly duo, Batman and the Joker. It's bittersweet because of what an epic run it's been, but yeah, it's it's going to be awesome. So check it out Tuesday at 10. Be here. And uh, that's it. Aaron, where can we follow you at if we want to see more of your work? If there's somebody new in the chat that doesn't know who you are, where can they do? Twitter. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm just at Aaron Lopresti on Twitter. I'm Aaron Lopresti at Facebook. I'm Aaron Lopresti on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm on YouTube so under Aaron Lopresti. So uh, if so you spell simple. my name, you can find me. Love it. Love it. Uh, there we go. There is yeah. the, there's the link. Thank you, Hill. Lord, and appreciate website you. is www.aaronlopresti.com. So there you go. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> uh, guys, we are trying to get more of a following on Rumble. I have a link at the very top of the chat. If you haven't yet, and if you have an account over there, please check us out. Follow us over there. We'd like to do uh, uh, multi-streams, but we have to get to 50 followers. We are we want to cross the away. streams. We want to cross the streams. Oh, six six people away right from here. being able to do that. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. This was a hell of a fun show. Um, we will Great be show. back. Follow everybody. Find a chat. Find a stream out there. Have some fun. Be good to each other out there. Take care of one another. And as always, picture me naked. Talk to you all later. Peace. <laughs>